I welcome you all to the CREACT for Med annual conference 2021. Uh, CREACT for Med is a project funded by the European Union uh, Europe Aid Programme and coordinated by the Euro Mediterranean Economies Association to strengthen businesses and create jobs by giving support to entrepreneurs, startups, SMEs in the cultural creative industry, which is uh, called in this project CCI. Uh, the project targets specifically young people uh, and women in the southern neighborhood of the European uh, Union. CREACT for Med is a collaborative initiative with partners from the Euromed region. And I highly invite you to visit our website, www.creativemediterranean.org, to know more about the details and about the activities that we have achieved over uh, these years. Now, 2021 was declared by the United Nations as the International Year of Creative Economy for Sustainable Development. This gives an essential momentum to boost this economic sector, also uh, while into, uh, taking into account uh, the global health situation uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic, which uh, unfortunately had disastrous effect on the cultural creative industry worldwide. Now, uh, our initiative, Creative Mediterranean, has ambitious aims, and we want to be ambitious, mainly uh, to promote the creative economy in the Mediterranean from a public policy standpoint via proactive engagement of the key institutional players that are really active in this uh, industry. Now, also to create jobs for, specifically for women and uh, uh, youth, via supporting them and supporting specifically the entrepreneurs to create value, to connect, and to generate decent uh, jobs. Also to strengthen the cultural and creative entrepreneurial ecosystems in the Mediterranean and enhance the collaborations uh, with Europe, with other regions of the world, Africa, and beyond. Now, the cultural creative sectors have been uh, growing, uh, but not as much in the Mediterranean uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, regrettably, uh, the major disruptions uh, happened. And then obviously the sector has been largely affected uh, by uh, the pandemic. Now before that, the sectors contribute much uh, economically and socially in uh, uh, worldwide, in fact. They boost creativity, innovation, economic and job creation, particularly for women and youth, and also in general for the well-being and overall health uh, of the society. Because actually when we talk about creativity, we also talk about enhanced uh, mental uh, health and also in terms of the cultural and artistic expressions. These are also sources of positive spillovers to the economy as a whole. And I, based on the data that we've seen uh, and actually only available up to 20, uh, 2017 by the World Bank, uh, the CCI is estimated to contribute of up to 7% of global GDP. This is quite important. Now, uh, the cultural creative sector, uh, mainly, for example, architecture, design, photography, and many others, uh, there were 1.2 million cultural enterprises generated or more than 193 billion of value added uh, in the European Union. If we look at uh, the European Union, where the data is largely available. Unfortunately, in the Mediterranean, South and East Mediterranean, which is the South neighborhood country of the European Union, there is no comparative data. Uh, I mean, the sector practically is much fragmented and there is no clear definition of what it is. Where we know very well that in this region, uh, there is huge cultural diversity, richness and creativity, but unfortunately it has not been locked uh, unlocked, sorry, uh, with the potential for the economy and the, the society. Now, we cannot also forget that we are living in a major transformation, major transitions, in terms of digital transformation, sustainable, and also health transitions, which also call for uh, a clear coordinated actions between public and private actors to accompany this nascent economy to be the motor for change and transformation. Now, uh, empowerment of the culture and creative sector must also consider the following. First of all, to, uh, to raise uh, awareness and provide incentives. 
I think providing incentive is key in terms of tax, in terms of also state aid and all of these uh, that are uh, very important. But, uh, we know very well uh, that the fiscal space in this country, uh, in these countries in the South Mediterranean is very uh, small. Also to promote cooperation networking at the local, regional, and global levels uh, via, for example, funding regional program. And this creative Mediterranean, the Create for Med project is funded by the European Union. Also encourage sharing of best practices and experiences using the digital platforms and engagement uh, for engagement and for sharing uh, good experiences. Enhance human uh, resources capacity via training, coaching, mentoring, and also promoting an enabled uh, environment at all levels, institutional, also with a clear focus on cutting uh, the red uh, tape and uh, also cutting any other administrative burdens for these companies to develop and to uh, prosper. Now also to enhance access to finance and financial inclusion, particularly for the artisans and the solo artists who uh, can find themselves sometimes isolated and with no uh, support. And finally, and this is not an exhaustive list, is to tackle the challenges in the creative economy uh, such as, for example, the fragmentation, as I mentioned previously, and also the censorship in some countries. Now, uh, our initiative is striving to unlock the potential of this industry in the Mediterranean and to create the link, the interconnections with the European actors to build complementarities and synergies, at least at the first stage. Now, we started by building collaborative local hubs for five countries of the European uh, South neighborhood, built on the existing role of project partners uh, that are within the Mediterranean, also incubators, accelerators, and other uh, civil society organizations, while seeking support from the private uh, public sector uh, when available, and also from, uh, as I mentioned, the European Union, which has been a key, uh, a key actor in this, together with the delegations in these countries. They have been very much supportive since we started these actions. Uh, our interventions are act, uh, anchored in uh, three mutually interactive uh, dimensions. Number one is to uh, access to open uh, uh, knowledge and skills uh, via accessible to uh, access uh, to knowledge and to online training, coaching and mentoring. Uh, already on our website, you can see that we have published uh, uh, five reports, uh, which are for five countries. We are still finalizing this mapping exercise. And also we have launched the engagement platform, which is already active and all of uh, the actors in this sector could uh, register uh, in this uh, platform. Uh, but also uh, we, we are in the process to uh, develop the regional observatory on uh, the CCI. We have also uh, launched several calls for, train uh, for trainees if, because we are going to do training. Uh, in the uh, in this uh, in this sector, but also for trainers, uh, and uh, we have uh, already uh, launched uh, the uh, the uh, we, we will start already the evaluation for this uh, for these calls in the upcoming uh, weeks. Now the second dimension is access to grants and innovative financing schemes, co-developed also with the financial sector when possible. We have already launched the sub-granting calls for uh, the incubators. So four incubators will work on these initiatives in, from four countries for the moment, and we will continue the evaluations for the other countries. And we will make the announcement for the winners uh, in uh, this conference. And finally, access to finance and market. Uh, with our platform, we are planning to enhance the regional collaborations and uh, also to we aspire to enhance market access uh, during the implementation of this initiative. Now, as I mentioned, uh, our ambition is to connect these local hubs via the regional hub uh, coordinated at the Euro Mediterranean Economies Association headquarters in Barcelona. Uh, that would also link uh, the creative uh, Europe and also other hubs, US, Canada and others, but also Africa. And uh, we would like, uh, hopefully, to uh, scale up this initiative to enhance its overall sustainability. So let me also uh, emphasize the fact that the Euro Mediterranean Economist Association is located at São Paulo Art Nouveau, which is declared World Heritage by UNESCO in 1997. 
and it is also uh, hosted the most important work by the Catalan architect Luis Domenic Montaner. So it's really uh, an icon here in uh, in Europe. And this transformed site has a great uh, uh, potential. It is a great space for cre where creativity, history, and innovation go hand in hand to become one of the main reference points in the city of Barcelona and in Europe. This is really very important for us. Um, Regrettably, we could not enjoy uh, this site uh, where we are located for this annual conference, but hopefully next year we have a face-to-face -face annual conference for the Creative Mediterranean and Creative Med uh, project. So, um, as I mentioned, there are many uh, challenges for the sector and I'm not going to dwell on them. So, uh, you can, I invite you to read our reports about the challenges for all the countries. But we'll continue uh, producing notes uh, to enhance uh, the awareness for the policy making in the, in the region. But mainly, we just need to realize that we are moving into digital transition and also uh, distance education. And this will have serious impact, uh, positive impact on how the sector will uh, uh, evolve over the years. Um, so I think this is practically what we 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 have been doing over uh, over this year. We started this project in uh, in March 2020, in the middle, in fact, of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So there has been disruption, and I think uh, we we are trying really to adapt our business models also to the online and the digital platforms to uh, to accelerate the implementation of this uh, project. So this first annual conference uh, is really aiming to uh, raise awareness of the role of culture and creativity as a vector of employment and value generation in the South and Mediterranean countries. In these two days, uh, we will showcase uh, our uh, project progress, provide the space for uh, incubators, entrepreneurs, policy making bodies and regional initiatives uh, um, to present their project and achievement in the CCI sectors. Uh, we will also, as I mentioned, announce the winners of the sub-granting calls for the incubation services for Egypt, Tunisia, Lebanon, and Morocco. And then we will continue the evaluations for the other countries and also the other activities. Uh, with this, I end my intervention. Uh, and I would like to ask the team uh, to showcase the video about our initiative. Uh, so please, uh, you can show the video. It's only 2.5 minutes. Please. Cultural and Creative Industries, CCI, bring together the entrepreneurial and the creative, the artistic and the commercial. CCI contribute to job creation and economic growth. In 2017, the World Bank estimated that CCI accounted for 7% of global GDP and up to 10% in the MENA region. But they're also essential for the well-being of both individuals and communities, and the development of creativity, societal cohesion, identity and culture. 2021 is the UN International Year of Creative Economy for Sustainable Development, celebrating the potential of CCI to boost economies and support post-pandemic recovery. CREACT for Med is funded by the European Union and led by the Euro-Mediterranean Economists Association with partners from across the region. The project aims to boost cultural and creative entrepreneurship in the EU southern neighbourhood, with a particular focus on supporting young people and women. The project's main activities include mapping the current landscape of the CCI sector. We highlight the salient features of cultural and creative industries in each country actors, initiatives, obstacles and opportunities to provide targeted policy recommendations. Training CCI entrepreneurs to launch and maintain successful businesses. Our academy will train 240 entrepreneurs in the southern Mediterranean countries on business, legal, financial and marketing aspects of starting and running a CCI business. 
financing startups and incubators. We're giving grants to at least 24 entrepreneurs in eight business support organisations to help launch and grow new CCI businesses. And finally, raising awareness of the importance of CCI in building strong, resilient and creative societies. Join the community at platform.creativemediterranean.org. Now I have the pleasure to introduce Ingrid Schweiger, uh, Deputy Head uh, Unit of Regional Cooperation Neighborhood uh, South European Commission. So that's the Director General for Neighborhood and Enlargement Negotiation at the European Commission. She's also the head of the economic uh, section. Ingrid, she's an economist uh, by training. She has worked at the European Commission for more than 25 years focusing on external relations, uh, but also she dealt with a wide range of, uh, of, of issues in economic cooperation, private sector development, financial instruments, uh, including access to finance and a number of uh, files uh, related to neighborhood policy. We've been working for many years with Ingrid on uh, other projects, and I'm extremely happy to have you with us, Ingrid, today. Uh, to share with us your vision, European Commission vision, about the role of uh, CCI, culture and creativity. Please, Ingrid, the floor and the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rim. And uh, really, it's a pleasure to, to be with you opening this annual conference uh, on behalf of the Commission. We are very glad uh, in the regional unit to uh, assist in the conference and also to see uh, you know the all the stakeholders taking part from the cultural and creative industry uh, as well as as from the public side and from business support organizations uh, correct format is actually uh, part of our continuous assistance to cultural and creative industries uh, via entrepreneurship support under the job creation angle for us, it's a very important area. And our aim is to contribute to an inclusive and sustainable growth in the South Mediterranean region, strengthening the competitiveness of the sector. Uh, in the past, uh, we had uh, supported kind of predecessor, a regional program called Creative Mediterranean, uh, which was uh, run by UNIDO until, until the year 2020. And where we already started at regional uh, level to demonstrate the potential of cultural and creative industries by providing technical assistance. I mean, there the focus was on 13 uh, creative and cultural industry clusters in uh, seven countries of, of the region. Uh, Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Palestine, and Tunisia. And uh, uh, this, uh, there we also supported uh, improvements in cost and quality management, uh, development of design capacities, uh, and very important also access to, to international uh, markets. Um, and this is very concrete work. And, and just to give you examples of, of past uh, engagement, uh, one of the clusters concerned the, the copper industry in, in Algeria and worked with uh, copper products uh, of, of Constance Dean's uh, coppersmith district, uh, uh, supporting the Chamber of Crafts and Trade, uh, supporting a traveling exhibition of copper products to Europe, connecting European designers. Uh, this, uh, you know, one concrete uh, example for, for, for Algeria, I could also examples of, of female textile designers and handicrafts in Egypt or of the pottery and ceramics industry and the craft makers in, in Tunisia. What for us is important, and here it's really the regional aspect of that and the regional cooperation, is that regional projects very often, they act as a pilot and to share the experience. And, and in that sense, we are very happy uh, that CREACT uh, format is following this regional approach. 
in in the past this has led for example to morocco continuing you know part of this policy uh, as part of the national strategy of morocco and uh, uh, in the case of lebanon for example uh, this type of activities has then been taken up as a bilateral project by uh, financed by the eu delegation in in lebanon and these are examples how how the regional can act as a as a stimulator and 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 lead to to much more than than just uh, the regional uh, initiatives in the first place. So for us, uh, Create for Med is continuing these efforts, and uh, today uh, we understand that the results of the mapping will be presented. Very important phase to identify uh, the state of play and the relevant stakeholders and, and to see what are the current topics. Of course, uh, Rim, you mentioned that already. This comes at a time uh, when COVID is not yet over. Um, so, and the pandemic certainly had an impact on, on, on the cultural and creative fields. Uh, with the numerous lockdowns and the limitations on circulation of goods and services. So in that sense, the mapping comes at the bad, but also at the good moment, because it allows us to see how the pandemic influences the sector and what lessons we can take from that and learn from that. The European Union stands ready to support activities uh, and to help the recovery after the pandemic in the region. Uh, the main priorities have been reflected under our joint communication, a new agenda for the Mediterranean, which was published uh, this year in February. And that was also the moment to incorporate new trends uh, into our cooperation, uh, in particular the green and the digital transitions, but also EU priorities such as an economy that works for people, to, to adopt this people-centered approach uh, uh, in the economy to, to provide benefits for society. The communication is accompanied by an economic and investment plan for the southern neighbors. Uh, one of our main tools to, to, to reach the objectives with 12 indicative flagship initiatives in priority sectors, and they are based on concrete suggestions from the southern partners and, and also our EU delegations on the ground, um, aiming at the sustainable and inclusive socioeconomic growth. Under the economic priority of this uh, communication, building prosperity, we commit to work towards building an inclusive, resilient, sustainable and connected economy and, and restoring trust in the, in the business climate. And we are aware that micro, small and medium sized companies and enterprises, they are the backbone of the economy. That's where the job creation uh, takes place. And uh, that's why we will support access to finance for MSMEs uh, in the future. Job creation figures very prominently in this context. And also as part of our multi-annual programming exercise. And there I'm very happy just to flag that we are working on a regional team Europe initiative on the topic of job creation through trade and investment uh, for the Southern neighborhood. And uh, this is an initiative where the Commission, EU member states, their development agencies, uh, and the, the finance institutions uh, and the European finance institutions join forces towards this objective of, of job creation. So that gives you a bit of the, the, the policy context we are actually working on. And uh, I'm very, very happy to note that uh, Create for Med is, is very well aligned with this policy context and can provide concrete experience uh, in this context. So we are very much uh, looking forward uh, to, to the upcoming results. We are also preparing um, new programs, future programs uh, to stimulate uh, an environment which is conducive to innovation and job creation. Just to flag that earlier this year, we published a call for projects uh, on innovation, uh, cluster cooperation, and the startup ecosystems in the South. 
again with the objective to support uh, the creation of sustainable jobs in the neighborhood south. And this will be achieved uh, via uh, industrial cluster cooperation, uh, but also building capacity of the, the different institutions and players of the ecosystems uh, through exchange of expertise and uh, cooperation with European clusters and, and net networks in, in this field. Um, just to, to say that uh, this is a two days event, uh, my colleagues will be here in the conference also tomorrow to, to, to listen to the presentations of the selected incubators under the correct format. Uh, and under the recent call, which was addressed to business support organizations, incubators and accelerators in the cultural and creative industries in several countries. So you mentioned them, Rim, Egypt, Lebanon, Morocco and Tunisia. So we are at a very exciting start, uh, as I said, from a policy perspective, very interested also to follow, you know, how that your initiative is, is succeeding hopefully in creating jobs especially among women and and young people and in that sense i wish you all the best for for the upcoming presentations for the two days and uh, looking forward to interesting discussions thank you very much and back to you thank you very much uh, ingrid and i want to reiter uh, reiterate once again uh, that the support of the eu on this sector is very important but beyond this on all the economic sectors that can generate uh, employment particularly for women and youth uh, i think this is very much appreciated and we continue working together to achieve those uh, objectives for uh, for the region. So again, thank you very much. And I hope you remain with us uh, in these two days with your colleagues. Uh, now I would like to uh, welcome uh, the keynote uh, speaker for uh, today's, uh, for this conference, uh, Pierre-Louis Sacco. Uh, Pierre-Louis, he's a professor at the ULM uh, University of Milan senior researcher at the Meta Lab at Harvard. Uh, and also he is a senior advisor to the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Region and Cities, uh, among some of uh, the activities that Pierre Luigi is doing. I'm very happy to have uh, Pierre Luigi, who uh, in fact is an expert on uh, culture and creativity, management of culture and creativity. So uh, Pierre Luigi, the floor and the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rim. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today, in particular because, uh, of course, uh, it's very important to, to stress the emphasis of uh, culture and creative industry and more generally action for uh, an area like the Mediterranean, where uh, this could really bring about uh, very, very important results in terms of uh, job creation and long-term growth. We are uh, in a especially interesting moment in this regard um, in the European space, because as we know, there has just been uh, the issue of the call for the upcoming uh, KIC, uh, Knowledge and Innovation Community on Culture and Creative Industries. And this is an unprecedented uh, uh, jump in the priorities of uh, cultural creative production in the European agenda. If we think uh, that uh, the previous uh, cult um, knowledge and innovation communities that have been launched by the European Union have been on topics like uh, uh, energy or digital or climate. The fact that uh, cultural and creative production is put at the same level as those, of course, is extremely important and uh, speaks volumes in terms of uh, how much is today uh, uh, prior prioritizing this particular uh, topic, uh, this is being prioritized in the, in the European uh, Union agenda. But uh, I want to emphasize one aspect that is probably a bit more overlooked. Clearly, with, with the launch of this project and more generally with the strong emphasis that uh, Europe is placing on uh, issues of um, culture driven local development in terms of the job creation and growth creation potential of creative production, of course, we touch a very important topic. But that's not the only one. The one on which I would like to concentrate my attention for this uh, brief talk is uh, another aspect that is uh, strongly being emphasized now, uh, both by the 
this cycle of the European programming, but also in terms of the methodological innovation that has been introduced in 2018 with a new European agenda for culture. With this document, which is uh, giving the context for much of the European Commission action in the cultural field now and the years to come, we see that uh, there is a new line of interest that is not simply the economic impact of cultural creative production, but is the social and transformational impact that it can have. And this in particular means the behavioral change dimension that is really becoming crucial in tackling societal challenges from a different point of view. And as I will briefly argue, this is not at all in uh, contraposition to the job creation or to the growth, uh, uh, of course, facilitation that is, uh, that is uh, generally expected from the economic dimension. The social dimension is equally able to contribute to these particular aspects in a very innovative way. First of all, in the new European agenda for culture, there is a strong emphasis towards what is called the cultural crossovers. So the idea that there can be deep cross contaminations between cultural and creative production on one side and uh, crucial uh, areas of societal challenges like uh, health and well-being, like social cohesion, and also, of course, uh, with one uh, areas which have a more direct economic impact, like innovation, and uh, uh, of course, uh, new models of education. It's interesting to stress that in the original formulation of the new European agenda, uh, there is not an emphasis on environment and, and climate change. But the reason why there's not such an emphasis is simply related to the fact that in 2018, we didn't have yet a strong enough uh, scientific basis to link uh, behavioral change from cultural participation to the major climate related challenges. Now, of course, this is uh, quite apparent. And as a consequence of this, we can also, in some sense, read the initiative of the new European Bauhaus in this regard. It's a recognition that, uh, and uh, the European agenda is very explicit in this regard, it's a recognition that uh, even uh, some of the priorities that were not initially singled out individually in the agenda could have been added afterwards when, the, of course, the priorities uh, would evolve as a consequence, of course, of the structural changes that uh, the world was, uh, of course, uh, undergoing. And, um, this idea, of course, is now also bringing to the fore in a very, very prominent way the role, specific the role of cultural crossovers in this new and uh, crucial field, which is environmental and climate change. In this regard, uh, it's important to, 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 to realize this, why culture could be a, a very, very important lever of uh, societal change and behavioral change. And this has to do with um, our understanding of why culture is important for humans. When we consider the economic dimension, we tend to stress especially the entertainment dimension of cultural participation, because of course, this is where we can cater the most in terms of a paying demand for cultural products and services. But the point is that uh, originally, Culture was not uh, mainly developed in humans for entertainment purposes, but it was deeply linked to our uh, understanding and the uh, decoding of the complex environment that we were uh, embedded in. For example, today, and this is especially thanks to the recent developments in cognitive and social neuroscience and psychology, uh, we are, for example, understanding uh, very well how human narratives, for example, fictions, are so crucial for humans for uh, uh, aspects that have to do with social cognition. So for example, for better understanding uh, the intentions of others, the desires of others, the behaviors of others, and the fact that people get fluent, for example, that get immersed in narrative environments, uh, significantly improves their capacity to socially interact with other humans in effective ways and uh, in some sense, uh, for example, narrative immersion becomes a survival resource. And this is, for example, one of the reasons why humans have developed such a craving for narrative 
why humans are so, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, intent in uh, following a story that concerns characters that we know never existed. I mean, from a purely rational point of view, it would seem completely counterintuitive. But the reason is that uh, there is an enormous rational from the point of view of our uh, capacity and skills building. This is true more generally from the point of view of uh, the relationship between, for example, cultural participation, cultural experience, and our own psychological well-being, which is an aspect that is so important for, uh, uh, for example, the post-pandemic scenario. We even know that the systematic cultural participation throughout the life course, even accounting for confounders, explains a more or less 2.5 years of extra life expectation, for example, with respect to people who do not participate systematically in cultural activities. All this can be considered as a very stimulating basis for uh, a new approach to culture as a driver of behavioral and societal change. Because what we also learn is that uh, through these skills that are acquired through cultural participation, for example, People have an opportunity, not, it's not mechanical, but there is an opportunity, for example, to behave more prosocially. There is an opportunity to better, for example, manage uh, cultural diversity and the implication that it has for our own behaviors, social perceptions, and so on and so forth. For example, we are less intimidated by cultural diversity, by behaviors and customs that are not familiar to us. So as a consequence of these of many and many other uh, dimensions, we can say today that the capacity of people to adapt and change uh, with respect to the societal challenges like the ones, for example, of the green uh, transition or circular economy or a multicultural society are deeply related to our capacity to, uh, in some sense, develop the appropriate skills through cultural participation. But since we are speaking uh, here about uh, create for men, so in particular the Southern European, Northern African, and Mediterranean area, I think that there are in particular a few uh, challenges that in a moment like this could be particularly interesting to take on from this point of view of culture as a platform for uh, societal uh, transformation and behavioral change. One is related, for example, to the climate change dimension, like for example, the threat of desertification or in Mediterranean areas. This is of course something that is not exclusively related to behaviors and to trends that materialize in the Mediterranean basin. But certainly there is much that can be done in terms of pursuing specific projects of social impact uh, to, to foster, to, to counter at least to some extent, the trends that bring about the desertification in many areas, for example, in terms of uh, social patterns of use of, uh, of soil, uh, of land, uh, in the, of course, the more generally, uh, the, the current prevailing uh, attitudes towards, uh, for example, uh, local economic development and uh, in, the, in the trade off, for example, with the wise management of, uh, of uh, land preservation and renovation. Or think of uh, income and resource inequalities. Uh, we, we know that uh, there is, for example, a, a concentration of uh, convergence regions in the, in the southern quadrant of Europe and more generally in the Mediterranean basin. So, for example, the challenges of cohesion policy are very much related to the Mediterranean area today, even if it's not the only one. And uh, wh what about migrations, of course? All the new issues that are related to the societal transformations of a continent like Europe that has to look at migrations from a different point of view. So the point is that we can start to think of cultural projects, not simply as an interesting and promising area of economic development, but also as possible laboratories to take all these very, very complex issues from different angles. And there is a very interesting repertoire of evolving projects in all these dimensions that is particularly interesting for example, in Sicily, there is a, a pilot project of the new European Bauhaus developed in the city of Favara, for example, close to Agrigento. Uh, the Farm Cultural Park project is becoming one of the most interesting uh, best practices in Europe in this regard. That, for example, is launching in a city that was characterized historically by extremely low levels of cultural participation, that is transforming this very unlikely 
the small uh, sleepy Sicilian city into a hub of social innovation. And for example, they are creating now a very, very interesting project of uh, reforestation based uh, cultural participation as a response to, to the climate change societal challenge, just to make an example. So the point is, uh, why not start to use these new possibilities that are contemplated by the new European agenda for culture to tackle these problems from a different angle? Not only this is not alternative, to the traditional uh, forms of uh, impact through the through the economic channel, but this is also particularly interesting in terms of job creation, because of course we need the new specialists for cultural impact. We have to train, for example, people who are able to design and implement projects in which cultural participation tackles issues of uh, mental health and uh, issues of social exclusion issues of uh, pro-social behavioral change in the environmental sphere. At the same time, this kind of services that can be generated through this uh, new area could be very, very impactful, also from the economic point of view, because there is, of course, a huge social potential demand for this kind of activity. So the point is, uh, let's broaden the, our view. Let's not simply focus, and I'm saying this as an economist of culture, so I know I am very aware of the importance, the crucial importance of the economic impact of cultural production. But let's not just take the narrow view and let's broaden our focus to understand that we are in the middle of a very, very interesting turn in which cultural participation can become much more and can contribute in a crucial way to tackling from a different angle some of the most uh, important and crucial societal challenges we have to um, face in the, course, in the coming future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pierluigi, very much for this uh, opening. And I, uh, and I think, uh, as you mentioned, um, the cultural activities and productions, they are very important in terms of also creative expressions and you know it could be a, even a lever for uh, well-being and flourishing uh, and you mentioned also in a post-pandemic uh, recovery plan uh, i think we need to uh, think beyond economic value absolutely we need to think about community value we need to think about social cohesion community cohesion and also understanding each other where we are uh, coming from uh, different uh, cultures and, 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 and di this diversity is very rich because then, as you mentioned, it can, it can create uh, even further value beyond the economic value and the job creation. So the flourishing concept and the well-being concept, uh, which is also the happiness, you know, all these new indicators for happiness could integrate uh, this, uh, this dimension. And I, I believe there should be more projects uh, in, in this uh, direction to better understand how culture could be, as you mentioned, a, a driver for behavioral uh, and societal transformation uh, toward more cohesion, more happiness and more well-being and flourishing overall. Absolutely. Of course, this project is not uh, doing this. Uh, we're trying really to stay in the reference model at, at this stage. Uh, but then obviously uh, we stay with the reference uh, model and then we will, that's why I think we need to be also uh, sustainably in our thinking and eh? beyond economics. I always, I'm an economist as well. As well. So, so I understand perfectly what you, you're talking about. We start with the reference and then we try to enhance or enlarge to other dimensions. We are working with the uh, many scholars nowadays also on the mental health issues and uh, we're trying to really develop what we call the uh, brain capital, uh, which includes the uh, creativity dimension. And I think culture is one very important uh, part of it. Thank you once again, um, Pierre Luigi. We were very happy to collaborate with you uh, in this project and beyond and trying really to enhance uh, uh, the portour, I would call it the frontier, uh, beyond economics and going into really social transformation and community uh, development and uh, as you mentioned in your speech thank you very much it's very uh, inspiring thank you now thank, like you, very to, much. thank you uh, i would like to move uh, uh, without further ado uh, to hand over to my colleague um yegane Faur Sfa, who is a researcher at uh, emea uh, Yegane, she is a, an economist and she holds a PhD uh, in economics from University of Paris Dauphine. 
she works on uh, entrepreneurship, SME development, private sector development, digitalization, economic modeling as well as social protection and demographic transition. Uh, she has worked with us on uh, create React for uh, Med, and she has been responsible for the mapping exercise. Uh, so I would like to give the screen and the floor to uh, my colleague Yagane to present the main uh, results of the mapping exercise, please. Thank you very much, Rim, for this presentation. Um, okay, let me uh, move on uh, without further ado uh, with the mapping and the, the results of the uh, initial mapping we have carried out uh, within this project of uh, the cultural and creative industries in the Mediterranean. So as a uh, small introduction, um, as it was mentioned also by Pier Luigi, there has been um, a new uh, raise of awareness regarding the importance of culture and creative industries and as a key component to, uh, to the construction of the new normal in the post-pandemic uh, era. Uh, culture and creative industries, they have a specific characteristics. For instance, uh, youth employment rate is usually higher within the cultural and creative industries. Productivity tends to be higher compared to other sectors and workers are more likely to be independent and self-employed, so they are more subject to informality. The crack format uh, mapping, uh, we have uh, already published three uh, reports uh, on the website, creativemediterranean.org, under the resources uh, uh, tab. And then um, the main uh, and the two other reports would be the finals and published in December uh, for Jordan and for Morocco. Uh, the, the main structure of the reports is that you start with a general overview of the over, overall con economic contents and also key figures uh, within the CCI. And then we identify key CCI actors and then we move on with identification of initiatives that promote CCI in the countries. And uh, we identify challenges and opportunities within the uh, sectors. And we uh, conclude with some uh, policy recommendations. The main input for the reports is provided by uh, Crack Format Technical Expert Groups, which is a group of uh, renowned uh, regional and local experts um, who aim to bring a multidisciplinarity approach uh, to the mapping. Yeah. And uh, the first step of the mapping is to uh, define what is uh, what do we mean by cultural and creative industries we have um, tried to seek uh, within each countries to, uh, to see whether at the national level there has been uh, such a definition developed and uh, unfortunately it has not been uh, developed in many cases except for morocco there is a definition developed by the federation of uh, culture and creative industries or FIC. Uh, Fédération des Industries Créatives et Culturelles. But apart from that, in other countries, we didn't observe a definition and a recognition uh, at the national level of the culture and creative industries. So we came up with this uh, the classification based on the literature. Uh, so we have been inspired from the definitions of the UN, uh, UK, Department of Digital, Digital Culture, Media and Sport, which was one of the first who had a focus on uh, CCI. And also the Singapore definition, which divide the CCI into arts and culture, media and design, and uh, the European Commission, of course. Uh, the uh, classification, having these uh, categories of arts and culture, media and design is a key component for us because uh, to our understanding, uh, arts and culture, I mean, these different categories, they have different sorts of contribution to the economy. Design uh, sector, we see the spillover more even in the industrial sector, for arts and culture, we have uh, this uh, dimension of uh, social uh, innovation, which is more present, and uh, the media sector is uh, a bit different. Uh, so in terms of the contribution, as uh, it was mentioned by Pierre Luigi, we have this economic, uh, which is the classic in terms of job cre creation and value added uh, to the economy. At the same time, uh, there was this emphasis. I'm, I'm very grateful that uh, Fred Luigi made this emphasis on non-economic aspects of social development, social inclusion, and development of national identity, cultural diversity, fostering innovation and creativity. Um, so these aspects are very uh, 
key and uh, they can be a lever for social innovation and behavioral uh, changes uh, that we need. Uh, but our uh, focus in the mapping was more on the economic aspects. For instance, we have uh, been looking at the level of experts and uh, because, okay, uh, the economic uh, identification is a bit easier and we can quantify it by indicators um, uh, in a very straightforward manner. Uh, so the latest data was available on CCI export was by UNCTAD. And as I said, the definition at the national level is not developed in uh, all of the countries. So we don't have uh, data at national level uh, that assesses the contribution of CCI to the economy. Uh, as you can see here that uh, the export uh, for Egypt is higher than uh, other countries, but again, okay, the uh, Egypt is a bigger country by, uh, in terms of population and GDP. However, when we look at the trade balance uh, for G Egypt, it's uh, pretty positive. Uh, but uh, the uh, understanding thing about this uh, Ankita data is that the contribution to the exports is, um, we have also the breakdown by sectors. I don't want to go to the details, but uh, this figure is just to tell you that uh, the configuration from one country to another is different. And uh, for instance, in Egypt, we have uh, the handicraft sector and arts and craft contribute to 53% over half of the uh, CCI exports. While in Jordan and Morocco, 70% of CCI exports is on design sector. In Lebanon, it's um, half design and half publishing. In Tunisia, we have 57% design, but at the same time, we observe that um, the um, new media, which is gaming industry and the digital media uh, is ga gaining momentum and now contribute to 29% of overall uh, CCI exports. And uh, the, the experts uh, for, in case of Jordan, they have um, uh, done an exercise to estimate the uh, contribution of the CCI in the economy. And uh, they have used the um, Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, the UK uh, DCMS methodology, and using the ISIC4 digit data uh, to identify uh, the added value and also the contribution of uh, CCI to the job um, within the uh, Jordanian economy. And uh, in 2018, they have identified that uh, CCI contributes to point to uh, 2.3% of GDP, and uh, the contribution of CCI was uh, on rise prior to the pandemic, of course. Uh, we have also uh, looked at the cultural infrastructure within the target countries. Uh, so the number of museums, uh, cinemas, theater, and libraries in order to make these uh, figures comparable, I have divided them uh, to the population. So here we can observe that, for instance, in terms of libraries in Lebanon, uh, we have above like 10 libraries per uh, 1 million people. Um, and what is also worth mentioning is that uh, the photo you observe here is uh, from the City of Culture in Tunisia, which was inaug inaugurated uh, in 2018. And it is um, the largest public cultural structure, uh, structure in terms of budget and also cultural activities. So we see that there is also uh, investment in the cultural infrastructure happening uh, in countries. And uh, another point we have identified in the, which is a key uh, sector in the mapping uh, is identification of key actors. So in order to identify the CCI ecosystem, we went through the identification of governmental actors, private sector actors, uh, and mainly those private sector actors are uh, business support organizations and incubators who provide, uh, provide support to culture and creative industries entrepreneurs, uh, so creative entrepreneurs, and also uh, associations and NGOs who support uh, CCI and academia, all of the uh, programs uh, on architecture, uh, fine arts, and uh, so on that are rel relative to the culture and creative industries. Uh, our next step, as uh, Re mentioned, uh, is to uh, uh, create this CCI observatory um, by identification of a wider range of actors, financing bodies, or further associations, even independent artists and creative workers, architects, and so on, 
and which will allow us to identify even clusters uh, for the culture and creative industries. So uh, the community building platform uh, has already been uh, launched, uh, so you can go and visit it uh, in platform.creativemediterranean.org. And uh, we um, invite all of the creative uh, stakeholders we encounter to go and uh, register within this platform and at their organizations. So um, we end up uh, by identifying them and uh, having being able to match them and build this CCI observatory. Another key component for CCI um, is uh, intellectual property rights. So we have tried to identify figures and data uh, regarding that, uh, that because um, culture and creative industries, uh, they go hand in hand with uh, intellectual property rights and IP management. Uh, so we have looked into the different IP help desks in different countries and the um, agreements signed in different countries and also the numbers of patent filings and so on. Uh, so in this figure, I um, put um, the evolution of the patent filings in the, some of the target countries. And uh, it, the figures are divided by uh, GDP um, in terms of uh, purchasing power parity in order to correct for the size of the economy and the income level of the countries. Um, this other dimension we have uh, been looking at is different initiatives to, that promotes uh, culture and creative industries in the target country. So we can identify, we have identified national initiatives and basically uh, many of them were, had a focus on enhancing entrepreneurship uh, at the general and sometimes enter, uh, enhancing entrepreneurship for women and youth. And uh, some um, initiatives were identified that had a focus on a specific CCI sub, uh, subsector or subcategory. Uh, but as I uh, mentioned before, within the region, we didn't observe like a definition for CCI at the national level. So we did, don't have like one policy or one initiative targeting CCI as a whole. But uh, for instance, in case of Egypt, there are so many initiatives targeting the handicraft sector, which is uh, one part of the culture and creative industries. Uh, in terms of international initiatives, we have also identified uh, many of them. And um, okay, the lists are not uh, exhaustive. Uh, so we have identified, we, we have observed that EU is very um, key actor in the uh, culture and creative scene. UNESCO, Gothe Institute, UNIDO, Institut Francais, AFD, British Council, GIZ, USAID. And, uh, you know, this is a non uh, exhaustive list. Um, we can go on. Um, the next step in the mapping was to identify uh, different challenges and then opportunities. So in terms of common challenges we observe for CCI in the region, uh, the main one is, uh, the first one is that CCI is not perceived by the government as a high value added sector or high impact sector. And that leads to a, mm, no, uh, a unified definition for CCI lack of comparative data available to assess and monitor CCI. So these are the main obstacles we have also encountered in, in the mapping exercise. And also the absence of policies and regulatory or legislatives to support the CCI. Uh, we have, uh, we can observe weak um, IP uh, management and uh, IPRs and the absence of adequate protection from copyright, uh, copyright violation and um, and also the difficulty to access finance, uh, as was mentioned uh, by Reem and, and in the opening, and uh, the lack of uh, access to market and limited uh, export uh, facilities and capabilities, uh, for instance, in terms of international certifications, networks, and so on. Limited management and entrepreneurial skills uh, of CCI entrepreneurs, so skill mismatch is a common uh, challenge and obstacle we observe and also high informality among the vulnerable CCI uh, workers. Um, and within the COVID uh, pandemic, we observed that those workers, uh, those CCI and creative workers, uh, they don't access uh, social safety nets and uh, are among the most vulnerable. So there are also challenges uh, per countries that are uh, identified. Um, probably I uh, passed through the ch uh, main challenges that, uh, identified in uh, only Lebanon uh, because of the very specific um, 
economic situation. Uh, so there are um, a number of challenges related to the current economic context uh, because of the political and economic instability, the numerous crises uh, hitting the country and um, the banking sector, which was uh, completely <clears throat> broken uh, and that led to a very high cost for credit, uh, very high un uncertainty level, um, which is bad for the economy as a whole and also high cost to uh, imported raw material uh, due to the uh, huge uh, currency devaluation and also weak digital infrastructure. We have uh, electricity cuts, internet cuts and so on. Uh, so these are uh, big uh, obstacles uh, for all entrepreneurs as well as CCI entrepreneurs. And uh, challenges specific to CCI as the small market size and also the IPR regulation is very outdated in Lebanon. Okay, let's move on to the opportunities. Uh, the common opportunities we observe in the region is uh, the diverse and the rich uh, heritage uh, that we have uh, in the uh, region, which is a source for uh, cultural and creative industries. Uh, we also have young and vibrant population. Uh, so the demographic structure is a key um, opportunity for the uh, culture and creative industries in the region to grow because youth are both the producers and consumers of the creative uh, products and services. Um, so there's a huge potential uh, within the region because of the demographic structure. And also we have opportunities rising uh, brought by digitalization and connectivity to international markets. Uh, so COVID-19, we know it has increased and uh, uh, the digitalization speed and that helps uh, uh, actors within the region to access foreign markets at a very low cost. Uh, I have, we have also identified like country specific opportunities. For instance, these are like a non-exhaustive list. In Egypt, for instance, we have these macroeconomic reforms, improving fiscal accounts, uh, wide recognition of the potential for the handicraft sector as a contributor to job creation in rural areas, especially for women. So there were so many initiatives, um, there are a number of initiatives uh, for Egypt uh, for the handicraft sector. In Jordan, we have numerous worldwide uh, known heritage site, sites and also endured, uh, the Jordan has endured a COVID-19 crisis better than uh, many of its peers. Um, they are uh, loss in terms of GDP um, was uh, minus one point something per, uh, percent uh, in that order. Um, and also we observe in Jordan that there's a diverse communities for creative workers. And in Morocco, we have recognition of the CCI compared to the other countries in the region and the aid provided to the CCI workers uh, due to the mainstreaming activities done by the FIC. And in Lebanon, we have a Lebanese CCI international reputation, which is a a great opportunity for ex to export. Uh, the talented labor force is often trilingual, agile, and very skilled. We have the current the, the current crisis also can be regarded as a source of uh, for opportunities because it uh, the currency devaluation increases the demand for local products, and um, in the, both in national and international markets. And in Tunisia, we also have, we have a vivid and flourishing entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, the creation of the status of the artist approved by the parliament uh, in 2021. So it's pretty fresh and it's a new opportunity for the uh, artists uh, to flourish. Okay, the last point, uh, but not least is the policy recommendations. So as a concluding point, uh, we have a number of um, policy recommendations evolving around, first of all, mainstreaming the CCI in the public policy. So this is a key component. And uh, I will come back to it uh, later and also create an enabling environment and to reinforce IPR issues. In terms of mainstreaming CCI in the public policy, this, this can be a multifaceted uh, uh, policy recommendation in terms of having a nat uh, national definition of CCI, collecting data to assess uh, and monitor the CCI development, and enhance coordination among actors and targeted policies for CCI. For the uh, creating an enabling environment, uh, we have different aspects as well, policies to tackle informality, which is key in the region, 
uh, having vocational training for CCI workers to tackle skill mismatch we observe in the CCI and improve the value chain by uh, assessing, uh, accessing, facilitating access to good quality raw material, quality control pr procedures in place to enhance exports and also to enhance knowledge and exports and also invest in digital infrastructure. There are also country-specific policy recommendations. Uh, for instance, in Egypt, a reduction of bureaucratic burden, uh, invest in high va higher uh, value added CCI. In Jordan, to provide tailored um, support to existing creative businesses, board, both in terms of better access to finance and training. Uh, in Morocco, we have invest in uh, raising awareness, education, and communication. In Lebanon, IP support can be strengthened. Uh, and reinforce collaboration among CCI actors, especially the diaspora, because it's one of the key uh, strength, strong points in uh, Lebanon. In Tunisia as well, encouraging public-private academia partnership to enhance creativity and CCI capability, and also uh, to enhance skill mismatch. So I um, conclude with some final remarks that uh, within that uh, South and Mediterranean region, we observe an untapped potential for the culture and creative industries. Um, so uh, as men was mentioned uh, by Rim in the opening, the CCI has the potential to be a key comp uh, component for job creation for youth and women in the region. And our, uh, CREAT format projects seeks to shed light on this potential and identify the key stakeholders. We uh, aim to build this uh, CCI Med Hub in the South Mediterranean region and collaboration among the key stakeholders is the key to reach this goal. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, please visit our website and uh, join our community. And I think uh, with this, we, we, we should move to the break. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Yagane, for this very, uh, I would say, a summary view of the five uh, uh, country reports. Uh, which took us some time really to uh, dig into the specificities of each country, particularly, as I mentioned before, uh, there is a huge lack of data on the sectors, uh, on those cultural creative uh, sectors. Uh, but thank you again. Uh, and then, as uh, Yegane mentioned, all the information is uh, publicly accessible on the website. Uh, so uh, now we will have a couple of minutes um, break and then uh, we come back with the next session.
Good afternoon. Welcome back to uh, the annual conference uh, of the CREACT for MET. Uh, and I'm happy to moderate uh, this second session about international organizations uh, support uh, to the CCI sector. Uh, first of all, uh, allow me to uh, express my gratitude, uh, deep gratitude to EMEA, uh, to the Euro-Mediterranean Economies Association, uh, and to its team for the organization of, uh, of this wonderful annual conference. My name is uh, Roger Albignana, and I'm the uh, Managing Director at the um, European Institute of the Mediterranean which is also a partner of the CREACT uh, for MET uh, project. Uh, culture and creative industries are enablers of sustainable development thanks to the capacity to recreate and redesign unsustainable practices. Culture uh, is, of course, a strategic element both in international development cooperation programs and national development policies. Culture and creative industries generate economic growth uh, and employ a lot of young people, as it has been said. As this sector uh, in the region, in the southern and eastern Mediterranean uh, region, is very fragmented, one sometimes uh, doesn't perceive the relevance uh, of this economic sector, but as it was um, projected, uh, beamed in the in the video, 10% uh, of the GDP in the region comes from this uh, sector. As a matter of fact, the value of the global market for uh, creative goods uh, more than doubled from 2008 billion uh, US dollars in 2002 to uh, more than 500 billion US dollars uh, in 2015. That means that it is a booming sector uh, that, is, uh, that is growing. Uh, more and more international organizations put investments in creativity and innovation on their sustainable development policy agenda, for instance, uh, through the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda. The International Year of the Creative Economy for Sustainable Development uh, in 2021, uh, promoted by the United Nations, focuses uh, the attention on the role of culture in the global economy and the objective of sustainable development. And in this uh, respect, uh, the cultural and creative industries have the power to become a sustainable partner in the EU's commitment uh, to implement the UN 2030 agenda. Uh, in fact, the European Commission is trying to assist the development of the region by placing human beings at the center of its agenda, as it was recalled by its uh, deputy head of unit uh, earlier on. Um, and, and therefore, uh, the culture and creative sector will need to have a pivotal role in this strategy and in this agenda that the EU uh, is trying to implement uh, in the region, precisely due to its uh, transformational nature. We would like to hear how other international organizations have supported and are supporting uh, the CCI sector, and this is the reason why we have invited an outstanding panel that I'm very happy uh, to, uh, to introduce. In fact, we have among us uh, the first uh, guest speaker, uh, who is uh, Ahmed uh, uh, Zaouj, uh, who has been uh, invited to, uh, uh, to intervene. Uh, Ahmed Zaouj is the program manager at the UNESCO headquarters uh, in Paris, um, and he's the manager of the UNESCO Ashberg program that is operational, that is the operational arm of the 2005 Convention for the Protection and Promotion of the Status of the Artists and Cultural Professionals. Uh, he holds a master degree in urban planning from the Science Po Paris uh, University and a master degree in architecture and heritage uh, from the Ecole Spéciale d'Architecture uh, at Paris. And Ahmed, I would like to ask you a couple of questions. Uh, what will be the place of culture in the Mediterranean's future competitiveness model? And how could culture and local development be combined with a territorial dimension in the Mediterranean context? So Ahmed, uh, the screen is yours for six, seven minutes. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Roger. I guess you can see my uh, my screen, right? The, the PowerPoint. We can see your screen. Now we can see your screen. Perfect. So Thank you so much. Uh, Thank alive. you so much once again for, for this opportunity. I'm really grateful to uh, Mrs. Rima Ayadi and all the EMEA team for inviting us. <clears throat> I would like to share the the to convey the the warm regards of Karim Handili, my colleague who was not uh, able to join us uh, today due to prior commitments. So I'm happy to give on his behalf a short overview about UNESCO's work when it comes to uh, cultural creative industries. And I will start this presentation uh, by giving you a, a short overview. I think this is very important about the 2005 convention on the protection and promotion of the diversity of cultural expression, as well as uh, how we translate it into concrete actions, including in the Mediterranean regions. And uh, through uh, technical uh, assistance to member states, research and capacity building and all this work would not uh, would have not been possible without uh, the important support of, of the European Union. Uh, uh, first, I mean, uh, as this has been mentioned already by Rima Ayedi and, and others, indeed, uh, and as per our uh, latest global periodic report, uh, the CCI uh, generate annual global revenues of 2.250 uh, billions and export over 250 billions. Uh, this sector, which currently provides uh, 30 million jobs worldwide, including among the youth aged 15, 29, uh, have uh, amazing uh, potentials. Uh, they can make up uh, up to 10% GDP in many uh, Mediterranean countries. The economy constituted by these sectors has become uh, a major driver of development and trade strategies in developing and uh, developed countries alike. Over the past two decades, uh, CCIs have evolved uh, drastically. Uh, this is particularly the case in developing countries where there is uh, a deep reliance on informal uh, cultural system, uh, which is also the case in the Mediterranean, and also on processes and institutions that may leave uh, many artists and cultural professionals beyond the reach of governance, regulations, and investment opportunities. And as uh, this has already been mentioned, we, we are aware how, to what extent, the, the COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated pre-existing factors of vulnerabilities related to the status of the artist and artist professionals. UNESCO has organized during the past two years over 270 debates in over 100 countries to document the impact of uh, COVID-19 uh, on the, the status uh, of the artist and the cultural creative uh, industries. So maybe a, a short uh, a snapshot on the 2005 convention. I think this is fundamental. Uh, this is the main uh, international um, legally binding instruments uh, for on the cultural creative industry. This was really a milestone in the international cultural policy. Uh, throughout this historic agreement, uh, the global community formally recognized the dual nature, both cultural and economic, of uh, cultural expressions and uh, produced by artists and cultural professionals. It recognizes the right of parties, and we have 151 parties, uh, 150 member states and the European Union to take measures to protect and promote the diversity of cultural expressions and then both uh, impose obligations at both domestic and international levels uh, on parties. It also provides a roadmap, uh, a plan of action to ensure that artists, cultural professionals and practitioners, as well as citizens, have the capacities to create, produce, disseminate, and enjoy a broad range of cultural goods, uh, services, and activities, including uh, their own. So it's really, the 2005 convention is at the heart of the creative economy, and uh, it's really, um, uh, it, it helps shaping the design of, of policies and measures that support uh, the creation of cultural goods and services. So the, uh, it's important maybe to remind the, the principles and values that underpin uh, the convention, which are first the sovereign right of states uh, to adopt and implement policies to promote the diversity of cultural expression based on informed, transparent and participatory processes and systems of governance uh, involving, of course, civil society organizations and, and other actors. Second principle is about uh, preferential treatments and mobility of artists uh, to ensure a balance flow of cultural goods and services. The third is about the integration of culture in national sustainable development frameworks. And the last but not least is about uh, the promotion of human rights and fundamental freedoms 
This has to do with uh, artistic freedom uh, as a prerequisite for creation, distribution, and enjoyment of diverse uh, cultural expressions. So uh, how uh, we do and how we keep track of those uh, wishful uh, thoughts, actually, it's about it's through the monitoring framework that UNESCO has updated uh, recently. We have a monitoring framework for this convention that illustrates different policies areas. Uh, it includes indicators, targets, and um, this is a roadmap actually for UNESCO to, to follow up progress. Uh, parties to the convention have statutory uh, reporting obligation, quadriennal reporting that allow us to, to keep track of progress made and to guide uh, technical assistance. And next global report will be issued in February, 2022 with important data related to the Mediterranean regions. So reports submitted by parties are reflected in this global report. So uh, I will try to go quicker, maybe as I have only a few minutes left. Uh, I think it's important to mention stakeholders of the conventions uh, that makes uh, the convention actually the responsibility of everyone. Of course, we have governing bodies, uh, but here I would like to, to maybe focus on the role of civil society uh, that is uh, extremely important. Civil society play a key role in uh, shaping the decision they taken by our governing bodies, the conference of party and the intergovernmental committees, uh, both on the future of culture policy, but also international cooperation through uh, the participation to fora we organized and through a uh, number of consultations. And for us within UNESCO as a secretariat, our responsibility is really to set up and implement a global agenda for uh, the parties to the convention to inform the decision through research and analysis and to provide funding for government and NGOs through uh, a number of mechanisms. We also operate uh, missions for uh, technical assistance and capacity building. And we help, uh, I mean, bridging the gap between uh, member states, I mean, civil society organizations and institutions. So it's really a dynamic instrument. And uh, there are many ways uh, through which uh, you can take advantage of the conventions as civil society organizations or, or uh, national institutions. And I would like now to, um, yes, so as uh, civil society organizations, institutions and, and governments, uh, I would like maybe to not to, to put, spend too much time on this to show how we can translate this into, into action. And the first mechanism uh, that is available that UNESCO has put in place is uh, of course the International Fund for Cultural Diversity. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of our program for capacity building, uh, research and, and information sharing. This is uh, really, uh, I mean, the main uh, and the unique multi-donor uh, voluntary fund established under the convention that fostered the, the emergence of dynamic uh, cultural sectors in developing countries, including in the Mediterranean region. And its overall objective is to promote sustainable development and poverty reduction through investment in creativity. Uh, with countries from the global north and global south uh, working together, uh, the IFCD has become uh, a powerful uh, international cooperation uh, platform and mechanism, and its results show how an investment in creativity can not only stimulate jobs and increase income, but also improve access to, to local and regional markets. And to date, since its creation uh, in 2000. Then uh, the IFCD has funded 120 projects in 60 developing countries with a budget of overall uh, $8 million. It also promotes South-South uh, uh, cooperation through peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchanges and transnational projects. Uh, the project Sorry, Ahmed, you should, yes. you should conclude. <laughs> okay. So I will conclude, I just want to, to mention that the, the areas of the, the sub areas of the ICCs are, are actually well defined in the international instruments, because I think um, uh, Yagana mentioned that there is no clear understanding. We have a clear common agreement on the, the sub areas of the, of the ICCs. Uh, and uh, I really invite you to have a look actually on how those are defined in the convention and guys the, the work of the IFCD. And um, I just wanted to mention two other very important initiatives, and I will conclude with that. Uh, those initiatives are linked to uh, the capacity building programs uh, implemented with the EU. Um, we have three main programs to translate the convention into action. The Ashberg program, which I'm in charge of, uh, that is the program 
providing technical assistance to country and all Mediterranean countries are eligible to apply to the call for project that is open until the 3rd of December. It offers assistance to revise legal and policy frameworks related to the status of the artists and cultural professionals. Uh, so the call is available. The second uh, flagship project is the UNESCO EU project, supporting new regulatory frameworks to strengthen creative industries covering 12 countries. And I would like also to refer to the UNESCO uh, CEDA project uh, about uh, research and, and capacity building in this area. Um, we have also this important EU, EU UNESCO uh, expert facility that is uh, fully operational uh, with a lot of expertise from the region and uh, assistance made available to countries uh, to shape their, their, their policy and we have very interesting progress. I can see that I think the mapping mentioned uh, the recent progress made in, uh, in Tunisia. We should also mention the one in Algeria with a, with a draft uh, law on the status of the artist. The one in Tunisia is not yet adopted by the government. It has been indeed submitted to parliament uh, back in July, but it's not uh, approved yet. And I really encourage you to have a look on uh, the recent publications focusing on specific sector, the latest one being the African Film Industry Report covering uh, seven Mediterranean countries and uh, which is available on our website and looking more into details on uh, uh, the trends and the opportunities in the film industry and how and proposing also some policy advice and uh, strategic uh, patterns of, of growth in this sector. Uh, I know we don't have much time. I thank you very much and remain available for the discussion. Thank you very much, Ahmed. Indeed, uh, we are we have a very tight agenda and uh, we want to hear also the rest of the speakers. But thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation uh, coming from an institution which has a crucial a key role. Uh, not only in promoting the CCI sector worldwide, uh, but also in protecting the rights of the professionals uh, that are uh, that are working in the in the CCI sector. So uh, thank you so much. And then now we move from uh, the UN system uh, into uh, an international financial institution uh, like the uh, World Bank. And it is my uh, pleasure to introduce to you uh, Nahla Seytun, uh, who is a senior social protection uh, specialist uh, from the World Bank. Uh, she's leading the social protections and jobs country dialogue uh, in Egypt and Saudi Arabia, covering uh, many different areas such as social protection strategies, cash transfers, food subsidies, reforms, uh, and others. And before giving the floor to uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Nagla Zaytun, I would like to ask her a couple of uh, questions. Uh, how would you consider the participation of youth and women in the cultural and creative industries? And what are the short and long-term expected impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on cultural and creative industries? Uh, Mrs. Uh, Zaytun, uh, and the uh, floor is uh, and the screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. And let me start by thanking uh, Professor Reem for inviting the bank to the to the event, and also to thank the European Union. Uh, and I would like to thank um, Yegana for the mapping exercise. I think it's uh, it's an excellent starting point because definitely having a clear definition and having the data is exactly what you need in order to inform uh, policies uh, going forward. Uh, from where I sit in, in the bank and from what Roger has asked me to do today is to focus mainly on the engagement of women and youth and how we see women and youth can be involved in the culture and creative industries in the Mediterranean and beyond, and also the COVID pandemic and how it affected the, 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 the challenges that came with it, but also the opportunities. I think uh, Roger mentioned the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, the 17 goals. They, they do place a great emphasis on inclusion. And I think uh, inclusion, uh, it's about including women and youth. So gender is a very strong part of that inclusion pillar. And there's a, a, there's a whole goal uh, under the SDG Goal 5, which is about gender equality and empowerment. And also at the bank, we believe that gender equality is central to our own twin goals, which is ending extreme poverty and boosting shared prosperity. And the bank in 2015 launched a gender strategy 
for the bank, uh, looking at three main uh, areas that are really interlinked. The first is to close the gaps uh, in human endowment, which is basically the gaps in health, education, and social protection. The second pillar is promoting access to economic opportunities. And this is measured through economic activities, access to control uh, over productive assets. It also, it's about more and better jobs, uh, promoting entrepreneurship, access to finance, access to technology, financial inclusion. So that economic pillar deals with all that. The final pillar is about voice and agency, which is basically freedom from violence, the ability to have voice and to have uh, to influence decision making and be in decision making position. So when we did that strategy in 2015, we were happy to see a, a big alignment with actually the national strategy in Egypt, because there's a national strategy for women's equality and empowerment. It's aligned with Egypt's vision 2030 and with the SDGs. And it has four pillars, uh, political empowerment, uh, leadership, economic empowerment, social empowerment and protection. So we see a very good alignment between the economic pillar that the National Council for Women is focusing on and what we are trying to do at the bank to promote uh, women's participation in the labor force. And let me just share a few challenges when it comes to women's participation. The challenges in, in, in MENA, and, and let me focus in particularly on Egypt because this is the country I'm working on, but what I'm going to say can, can, can be across the MENA countries. So while investments in health and education, in human capital in general, have been good, so the gender gap between boys and girls is getting smaller, this has not been translated into more women joining the labor force. And it's a very big loss, economic loss, because we, you spoke about GDP contribution through the creative industries. Let me tell you that if females in Egypt work at the same rate as men, GDP would increase by 34%. And that's, that's, a big, that's a big number. Also looking at unemployment, you will find that unemployment is much higher among the women. It's 17.7% uh, versus 6% for males. And for the youth, it's 15%. So as you, as you can see, both youth and female unemployment is quite high uh, in Egypt. Also the representation of women is not very much predominant in the private sector. They mainly work in the public sector. 36% uh, work in the, in the public sector and only 18% work in the private sector. So there is room to try to attract more women in the private sector through self or uh, wage employment. Also financial inclusion is very low in MENA. It's estimated at 29%. And for women in Egypt, it's 24%. And the challenges of female labor force participation are, are multiple. It's about mobility, it's about balancing productive and reproductive roles, access to childcare, access to affordable and safe transportation, access to finance, gender and social norms. So it's, it's a lot. And these challenges are magnified when you have a high level of poverty. And in Egypt, according to the latest household and income expenditure uh, survey, uh, poverty is almost 30%. And it can go up to 48% in Upper Egypt. So this is another dimension of regional disparity where rural women uh, face, uh, face much more challenges than, than, the urban, than urban women. Against this backdrop, I think uh, there has to be more concentrated efforts from all of us as development partners to help promote more women and youth to join the labor force, especially the, within the private sector sphere. Also, the, the issue of promoting entrepreneurship and access to finance and, and to non-financial services also has become very important, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 and the whole uh, lockdown that has happened and the unemployment that has happened and how the digital, uh, the digital platforms and the uh, you know, innovation in entrepreneurship can really make a big difference. And within this, the creative industry sector, we believe it can play a huge role to enhance the engagement of women and youth in economic activities. So for example, Egypt has a very rich cultural heritage, whether it's the Pharaonic, the Coptic, the Islamic, I'm sure your mapping looked at, at, the, at the diversity of, the, of, of this sector, whether it's the handicrafts, the film, the music, there's a lot going on. 
but as mentioned by Yegena, the awareness and the definitions, we, we need to do more around that, but there's a huge potential to boost these type of activities and to create more uh, quality uh, and more stand better standards uh, and better legal framework for, for, for this sector to flourish. And despite the negative implications of COVID, I believe that the creative uh, industry sector was one of the se sectors that actually survived during the pandemic because a lot of the work is home-based. So a lot of the women in, in, in Upper Egypt that work in the creative industry sector were able to continue to work through their partnerships also with NGOs. And it's, it's very important to talk about the NGO sector and also their role uh, to promote that to promote that sector in our work as the bank we have a lending operation with the ministry of social solidarity it's a cash transfer operation with a component called forza which is means opportunity and we're focusing there on graduating people out of cash and into livelihood uh, activities part of the sectors that we're, we're looking at value chains organic clusters agribusiness but also creative industries and we're trying to partner with NGOs to see how we can have the people that are taking cash transition into uh, livelihood activities. And we're trying to coordinate with other initiatives going on in Egypt, like uh, and, and other initiatives, so that we link with existing platforms and existing initiatives. We have another project with the Mathmeda, which is the um, institution that promotes access to finance, it's called Catalyzing Entrepreneurship. And it's all about access to finance, micro, small, and medium, uh, to women uh, and men and youth. Uh, but there's a strong focus also on creative uh, industry, agribusiness, and the renewable sector. Finally, the, the Egypt is launching a very big program called Haya Karima, which means decent life. It's an integrated initiative targeting uh, the poorest uh, 4,500 villages, focusing on a number of activities, including economic development opportunities through support to SMEs as well as artisanal businesses. And I think it's important for the work that you are doing to link with the Haya Karima program. This is going to be one of the biggest developmental programs in the country. And there's room to expand and develop the creative industry uh, sector within that framework. And also given that uh, Egypt will be hosting COP27, uh, there's a lot of discussion now around green growth, climate change, and how the creative industry can also contribute to make communities more resilient, but also contribute to actually waste management and innovating and using waste through, through creative uh, industries. So uh, let me stop here and back to you, Roger. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nahla, for, for a very interesting uh, presentation. I, I retain uh, what you said about the fact that fulfilling women economic participation would increase the GDP of at least Egypt by 34%. That's uh, an outstanding figure. And that the, uh, the CCI sector has a huge potential to enroll women and therefore boost uh, their economic participation. So I think that these are two very powerful ideas, but uh, thank you for, for your presentation. Uh, let us move to our next, uh, our next speaker, uh, guest speaker, who is Hadija uh, Jeluli, uh, who is uh, an architect and expert on communication, responsible uh, of communication uh, in the Creative uh, Tunisia project. Uh, she is uh, she's representing uh, there for this uh, this project, and I have a couple a couple of uh, of questions uh, for her. Uh, how can we reinforce the CCI sector and enhance its scale? And how can we better inform regional policymakers on the e economic impact of cultural industries uh, on the regions? How can we convince them to invest in cultural hotspots and, and cultural heritage? So, uh, Harija, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Bonjour à tous. Uh, merci beaucoup pour l'invitation. Thank you for having invited me. I'm sorry, uh, the sound is very, very bad. 
can you ask the speaker to speak closer to the uh, computer? Can you ask the, the speaker to get closer to the my, to the microphone of her computer? Otherwise, it will be impossible to translate. Can you Adia, ask? Sir. Yes. Can you speak closer? Yeah. Well, barely, but I'll do what I can. No miracles expected. Okay. En tout cas, on ne, on, on ne, on ne voit pas la, la présentation. Uh, donc, je ne sais pas si uh, l'équipe technique peut nous aider. Can the technical team? Yes. Thank you. Now we can see your slides. So I wanted to uh, present the Creative Tunisia project. This is a project to support the uh, craftsmanship sector. This is uh, financed by the European Union and the uh, AICS. It has been also implemented by the uh, um, Ministry of Tourism and Craftsmen. The budget is 9 million euros. So this is again, as I said, partners of the ministers. Again, the idea is to create a cooperation between the national also uh, federation of craftsmanship. Our objective is to reinforce the chain and value chains. What are the expected results? Five in total. Number one is to develop uh, the value chains presenting a competitive edge. Result two is uh, st strategies that will make us uh, different in order to have a better access to the market. And then we're also working on what we call multi-service support centers. This is what we call hub design. All this is uh, set up in each of the territories of the selected value chains. We're also working in order to strengthen local institution and also enhancing the Tunisian craftsmanship heritage. So seven clusters have been selected. You can see this on my map. It is uh, all over the country. From uh, north to south, you have one in Tunis, uh, you have Kasserine, Sa'el, you also have the Klim Kelfoa cluster in Al Kef and also uh, uh, Karuja. So that is uh, what the project is all about. But the idea is to successfully implement the cluster. Now, do not hesitate to ask further information on the hub, which is booming. Now, if you zoom in on the clusters, you will see that we have different actions to support these uh, clusters. As I said, we develop the product, integrate the design, structure the value chain, finance of corporate corporations, changing of managerial behaviors, development of markets, and improvement of the environment. So the idea is to have a holistic approach in order to really reinforce the chain. And this uh, applies to all the regions in uh, Tunisia. So number one, development of products and how we integrate this in the design. This uh, year, the project uh, uh, decided to organize 12 workshops in designs and with universities. We developed collections with 18 designers, over 300 products and 10 lookbooks. So as I said, these workshops are very useful because it means that students can really present their work and inspire themselves. The basic is really to work with uh, 
local partners. And to teach common work. The idea is to open up avenues for international markets. Now we're also working on how to have a better structure of the value chain. We created production workshops. We created also three groups with uh, equipment. For two years, we've also wanted to strengthen the abilities of companies. Uh, this is thanks to technical training with over 500 participants to these trainings. We've also supported the strategies development of marketing digital for over 25 companies. And we also want to have new techniques of productions. For example, a specific technique for embroidery or weaving. Uh, this is very specific to our local community, but we also want to include these production techniques. So basically, we're training the apprenticeship of uh, 200 new uh, uh, learners in this uh, copper and weaving industry. And we're also looking at raw material. So we help local companies to help them grow, not only nationally, but also internationally, whether it's in uh, Gabes or Kasseri. Uh, we help them buy raw material. I'm sorry, but the speaker is hardly uh, understandable. Uh, so we finance companies. So we uh, offer grants to 11 uh, companies, as I said, in Gabes and Kef, in order to help them buy raw material, but also equipment and uh, I would say specific uh, facilities. We uh, support companies that wish to be a uh, help uh, and through these grants. Now, another action that we've uh, implemented is how to have managerial strategies. Because we develop uh, cooperative projects, As I said, this uh, is to broaden and expand the uh, activities. It's extremely difficult for Tunisia to uh, reach out to international markets. And also sharing experience is uh, very important. And also making sure that the companies uh, benefit from what we call personalized coaching to help them develop their lines abroad. Now, a fifth action, this is again to boost the market and opening up new markets. In 2020, we took part in uh, various exhibitions. There's, well, before, because of the COVID, we couldn't attend every exhibition. But we uh, supported the uh, participation and contribution of several companies. We also help them uh, prepare their stand, highlight their products. So we try to see which company could uh, take part in these uh, fairs. And then we help them develop marketing items. Again, this is to really, uh, uh, sorry. Et à conclure. Ah, déjà? Déjà, oui, parce que <laughs> nous avons un agenda qui est très pressé, <laughs> malheureusement. Parce... Uh, uh, very busy. Thank you very much for your presentation, but we need to get close to the end. So market development, 
as I said, goes through marketing items with uh, some uh, catalogs. So 35 for companies. And we also want to improve the environment of clusters. This idea is to really support the training, training in partnerships with activities. What I wanted to show you as uh, with all the actions that we've done, we are uh, wanting to uh, create a hub. You can see the pictures on my slide, very designed. I'm sorry, but the speaker is, is, is not audible. So creating a hub. And uh, the idea is to uh, join companies and designers. We also support associations. Again, that work in the craftsmanship uh, department and sector, each association has a 30,000 euro budget. So we finance uh, five associations and we help them build an action plan. We also uh, support what we call economic realities. The idea is to also protect some items that are specific to our countries. We try to protect our heritage. So this is my conclusion. We are getting uh, institutional support. It's called ANATA. This is a, a kind of a study for re-engineering uh, sports structures. And it's a kind of mapping with over 300 associations that work in the design. So the idea is to really have a work uh, a website with several pictures, something that is very interactive and very useful for the designers, for the researchers. They can main, mainly find us through this uh, uh, website. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that you... Uh, no. <laughs> Merci, Radija. Euh, je suis désolé pour, euh, pour les problèmes euh, techniques que nous avons euh, expérimentés. Uh, let's move to, to our final speaker, uh, and it is my, uh, my pleasure and, uh, to give the floor now to my good friend, uh, Mohamed El Razas, uh, not without thanking him. Uh, to take the time to be with us uh, just ahead of the uh, UFM Regional Forum that is going to take place next Monday and that I'm sure as he is the uh, Regional Integration Coordinator at the UFM Secretariat uh, that is uh, creating a lot of burden and work uh, on him. So thank you, Mohamed, uh, for being uh, with us. As you know, Mohamed, not only a staff uh, member at the Secretariat of the of the UFM, but he's also an associate professor at the International uh, University of Catalonia, where he's dealing precisely with the subjects that we are uh, dealing with today. Uh, Mohamed, I have a couple of questions for you before giving you the, uh, the floor. The first one is how to promote cultural and creative professionals. Um, and the second question is how is the UFM assisting in the process of enhancing the CCI sector? Uh, so Mohamed, uh, the screen is yours. Thank you, 
you very much, Roche, and the pleasure is really all mine. It's always a pleasure to be able to collaborate with you and the partners here present and to be around the table discussing this very, very important topic of culture and creative industries and clusters and the creative economy in general. I will answer without further ado your first question about how we can promote um, creative entrepreneurs. And the truth is the answer would be multi-layer to this question. There are so many elements that I would like to highlight, starting with the policy level. As you all know, for every country, there is a policy model adopted which identifies and defines the interaction and the role assumed by the government of this country or this region or this province in the cultural life. Is there a designated budget for culture? Which segments are covered by the definition of the cultural and creative industries and clusters? Is the government engaged and involved in programming cultural activities? Does it own? Does it construct new cultural entities and institutions? In the mindset, does culture belong to the individual or to the community? And as such, does the government assume the responsibility of providing a vivid cultural scene and ensuring that culture would be accessible and readily available to a broad sector of the population, not to mention all the population? Is this the case or not? As we all know, there are three big policy models, uh, traditionally speaking, the Anglo-Saxon model, the US model, and the French or the Central European model. And under the economic repercussions of several crises, we have seen more and more countries shifting towards the US model, whereby there have been uh, budget cuts, there have been more restrictions, and unfortunately, only when you put a price tag on cultural and creative industries would the politicians listen in the first place, something that shouldn't be the case. But anyway, so there is this layer of the cultural policy adopted by the regime or by the government. Then there is also the layer of education and skilling, because um, it so happened that now that we're living the aftermath of the fourth industrial revolution, and as we wait for the fifth industrial revolution, whose currency we don't know yet, but for the fourth one, we know the currency is digital. And as such, more and more people tend to think of creativity in terms of digital innovation. And it's true that all these digital technologies have made life much easier for many entrepreneurs. And yet, in doing so, we forget about a very important tributary, a very important source of inspiration for creative workers and entrepreneurs throughout history, which is frugality. If anything, the Mediterranean has always been a cradle for creative ideas. And when we look back, and we have here the colleague from the UNESCO, it so happens that all the lists and programs and registers that the UNESCO has devised are not exhausted because there are so many other elements of cultural heritage that we share in this part of the world and that would not fit into any of the existing lists of the UNESCO. I'm talking here about knowledge models and curricula that were invented in the Mediterranean in the classical age by the Greeks and the Romans. Things like the trivium, the quadrivium, the seven liberal arts. You know? So uh, again, the concept of heritage is too broad to fit under one or a thousand lists and to be centralized by one or more uh, uh, entities. Uh, this is a, a call for all of us to engage even further and to work even more. Yet another layer that I would like to talk about is, of course, finance, access to finance and to the markets. To what extent are the currently existing financial instruments well suited to the specific needs of a creative company or a creative entrepreneur? I'm talking here about crowd funds. I'm talking about angel investors. I'm talking about joint venture at a later stage. I'm talking about so many things. But uh, <coughs> the colleague, uh, Ms. Zaytoun, mentioned the need to promote creative uh, SMEs. Uh, of course, I think she, she, she means MSMEs, you know, adding the micro dimension, because it so happens that most of the creative startups and even well-established uh, enterprises are micro or even nano organizations. They are based on a family unit passing on the know-how from one generation to the next. 
So um, in short, I would uh, highlight these three levels, the, the political level, meaning the cultural policy, uh, the, the educational dimension, meaning education and skills, enabling people to raise uh, generations of people thinking out of the box, and finally, the financial and market dimensions. <laughs> so you really stick stick to the time, but uh, thank you so much, Mohammed, because it's always great uh, to be able to listen to you and your reflections because they're always innovative and always new. So I don't know if we have some minutes for a Q and A uh, session in case uh, there are any questions that have been um, that have been uh, uh, asked, but uh, now I've been told that as we don't have questions coming up, I, I had some questions, so I, I can ask, but they are telling me that we are really at the end of the, of the session. Uh, Mohamed, do you want to take the floor? Please go ahead. Yes, just to take a minute to say what we have been doing as a union for the... Yeah, that was indeed, that was a second question that I asked you. So please, go ahead, go ahead. And I'll, I'll wrap it up very quickly. I'll highlight two uh, dimensions. One of them is the project level. And I would like to highlight a successful conclusion of a UFM labor project that was promoted by the UNIDO. And we have here a colleague from the UNIDO. Mm. All the establishment of a regional platform for cultural and creative industries uh, and clusters in the southern Mediterranean. So it was finally concluded a couple of years ago with very, very uh, uh, inspiring results. And the second is at the regional platform dimension, we have been partnering for three successive uh, uh, editions with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia to organize the Creative Forum Ljubljana, which has become one of the largest aggregations of cultural creatives, uh, creative hubs, fab labs, and interlocutors from the field. would love to announce early in 2022, so please uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for answering my, my second question. And it was, of course, very positive to see that the, um, uh, that the UFM, as we have already seen with uh, UNESCO, uh, with the World Bank Group, uh, as we have also seen with uh, UNIDO, is, uh, is currently working uh, and contributing to, the, uh, to enhancing uh, this sector in the region. Uh, as, uh, as a mode of, of conclusion, I would say that the COVID-19 has uh, exacerbated uh, some of the previously perceived vulnerabilities in the CCI sector, and therefore it's very timely that projects like the CREAC for Med project uh, is there not only to analyze and understand how the CCI sector is structured uh, across the region and in the various countries of the southern and eastern Mediterranean, uh, but also to act. Uh, and as it has been explained uh, by the uh, lead partner of the project, this is a project that has different components. Uh, so I will conclude by saying that I, I, I think that it's, uh, it's positive that, um, uh, that this project is, is currently being executed and that we as, as IMED, we look forward to uh, contributing uh, to the implementation of the project. So that being said, uh, I've been told that we are, of course, running out of time, as it often happens with this um, uh, with this kind of, uh, of conferences that are online. Uh, so we will now, uh, uh, and then we will, uh, I will hand over uh, the floor to, uh, to our next uh, session, uh, which is moderated by the well-known journalist, uh, Christina Ginet. So stay tuned, uh, do not leave uh, our conference now, uh, and we'll uh, be back in, uh, in two minutes. Thank you so much.
Hello, good afternoon, uh, good morning in the United States. We have a guest from United States. So um, I like, first of all, like to welcome you to this uh, session, to the session ecosystem enablement and barriers for cultural creative businesses in the framework of the Create for Med uh, project that is led by EMEA. Uh, First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Cristina Giner. I'm a Euronews correspondent and producer. So a little bit uh, also in this industry uh, as a producer. And I'm very pleased to be moderating this session today with uh, Montserrat Pareja and Theo Edmonds. Um, in recent years, um, CCIs are experiencing great challenges in digitalization, globalization, and then we had the pandemic, which has been an acute additional challenge for the industry. Uh, in this change in the scenario, I believe it's key to understand what are the uh, enablers and the barriers, uh, the factors that enable culture and entrepreneurship in the industry, and also to understand the obstacles. And this is precisely what we are going to talk um, this afternoon with Theo Edmonds and Montserrat Pareja. And I also uh, like to say that it's I believe it's going to be a very stimulating discussion because um, our guests are not only, let's say, academic researchers, but I believe as we journalists say, they're also professionals on the ground. So they work in the industry or with the industry. So I think this is going to be, to give us a very interesting and fresh insight on what is uh, really going on in this changing scenario um, that has also left the pandemic. So, um, and also I think it's going to be very interesting to understand what is going on in the United States and what is going on in, in Europe and have also this difference. So just very quickly before I introduce our first guest, I'd like to say that uh, this session is being broadcasted live in the EMEAS uh, and Create for Met Facebook pages. So everyone is aware. And uh, that at the end of the session, if we have time, I will take also the Q&A uh, from the audience. So if you want to, uh, to write the questions. I will try to take them by the end of the session. So, okay, let's get started. I like to introduce our first guest, uh, Theo Edmonds, who is um, Associate Dean for Transdisciplinary Research and Innovation, Culture Futurist, uh, uh, Transdisciplinary academic and researcher with focus on humanization, humanizing the future of work, industry, university collaborations, and private sector engagement leader, public health entrepreneur, cultural analytics inventor, developer of next generation corporate social responsibility initiatives in the creative economist, in the economy. And um, he co invented the Cultural Wellbeing Index. He has co founded a cultural analytics startup. And uh, as I said, he is also artist and poet. See, he knows very well the industry, not only from the academy, but also as an artist himself. So uh, be very welcome. And um, I, like, uh, I like to ask the question would be, what is the ground needed to enhance culture and entrepreneurship, especially among women uh, these days in this change in the scenario that we were talking about? So I give the floor now to Ed Theo Edmonds. Thank you very much, Christina. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Get going. Can I get a thumbs up if everyone can see the screen okay? No, can't see the screen? Mm, not as a mom. Oh, okay, there we go. Okay. Great, Perfect. thank you. So uh, we're not gonna have time today to go through in detail, but consider this a kind of uh, tour de force of a lot of the cultural forces 
that are taking shape in the U.S. context. In my role at the University of Colorado, Denver, I am the Chief Research and Innovation Officer for the College of Arts and Media. We are an industry-facing university, which means that we prepare students for the film and entertainment industries, the music industries. Our visual arts program is one of the top uh, uh, animation programs in the country. So we are preparing students for the future of creativity as a workforce. But before we go to the future, you know, I'd like to think about the past. If you go back a few hundred years ago, or even a thousand years ago, uh, a grandmother and her great, great, great granddaughter would live more or less the same life. Life was mostly local and linear, but the pace of technology today is at such a rapid rate that it is likely that a grandmother and her granddaughter will live radically different lives. I seem to have a little lag in my technology, so uh, be careful, uh, uh, kind with me. Uh, so as we think about <clears throat> creativity in the industry context, one of the things that I will share with you just a few weeks ago, I was in Rochester, New York, and Rochester, New York is the home of Kodak. And we see that when Kodak invented the digital camera uh, in the 19, uh, early 1990s, but didn't fully develop it, it was a bad decision that was based upon creativity being used, but not deployed. And so as we see this impact on industry, we look at somebody like Instagram, which with only 13 employees, ended up having a market uh, cap of about a billion dollars about 10 years or 11 years later. And so as we've gone from thinking about products in re more in the last 10 years, we've been thinking more in terms of platforms and experiences, the way we're thinking about innovation has fundamentally changed. And so as we think about innovation in different ways, the other thing to consider is if you go, if you look at, uh, say, Africa, for example, one of the fastest growing markets for Google, uh, in the last 10 years, there's been about 3 billion uh, new folks connected online. Most of those are not coming from a Western context. So as we see technology become ubiquitous, it's really the differentiating factor of how people use technology uh, that's going to become a differentiator. And so how people use technology is fundamentally a cultural question. And very few business leaders are going to tell you that their company is good at creativity. And I think that's mostly because creativity uh, business is a linear process and creativity is not. There's a certain requisite amount of freedom that's required in creativity. And, you know, despite the World Economic Forum raising uh, the issue of creativity to the top of the future of work skills, I still think at the end of the day, there is a kind of a notion in most leaders that are, especially those who are trained in an industrial economy, that introducing creativity at scale is going to cause productivity to suffer. When actually um, that the science tells us that is not true at all. So when we think about uh, how technology gets used and where the opportunities are and how culture shapes the questions we ask of data, it's interesting to think about where the uh, the latent capacity around the globe may be coming from. And I certainly believe that uh, female entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs are going to be a core piece of this. In the U.S., we see, especially uh, during COVID uh, uh, and coming out of COVID and even before to a certain degree, 31% of small businesses and franchises in the U.S. were women-owned. 17% of Black women are in the process of starting or running a new business. We see the entrepreneurial activity rate in the U.S. for females is about 16%. And yet, when we look at the venture capital and the private equity that are flowing to these female founders, uh, there is a real discrepancy in what we're seeing. And while there have been some uh, important strides made, I think about people like Arlen Hamilton, who runs Backstage Capital, a VC firm out of <clears throat> California that only invest in women, LGBT, and uh, BIPOC, uh, Black, uh, Indigenous, and people of color entrepreneurs, we are still at the very beginning of seeing dollars flow into people who have different ideas about where value is created in the market. And if we think about that, what we're really talking about is not moving money to a different set of people. It's moving money to a set of people who are thinking about value creation in a different way. And more recently, Fast Company had a very fascinating article in the design context around this. And I'll just uh, kind of read the quote there at the beginning, because I think it's really well written. In the design sphere, which has disproportionately been dominated by men, feminine design is less about a particular look or style and more about design with a purpose, be it social, cultural, or environmental. 
And so the way that we experience uh, our lives in the world, and it determines how we make meaning in our lives. Making meaning is fundamentally a question of value creation. So if we think about uh, in terms of uh, women entrepreneurs, uh, just moving uh, more women into the entrepreneurial space without changing the underlying ecology of how that space works is an ecological fallacy. So we have to think about what are the third spaces that we don't even know about today. And here, I believe that culture leads the way and is an accelerating factor or a barrier. And I love this quote from Krista, who said, a work of art is a scream of freedom. And certainly in the U.S. context, we've seen this happening over the last year. And if you think about the, the relationships and the parallels between the late 1960s and today, they're profound. Social justice, environmental justice, arts and industry have all been colliding again, much like they did uh, 50 years ago. And so when systems collide and prior mental models, these shortcuts of how we make decisions become fluid, that's an opportunity for innovation to really take place. The World Health Organization has uh, stated that the systematic neglect of culture and health and healthcare is the single greatest barrier to the advancement of the standard of health worldwide. So cultural is fundamentally about identity. And so when we think about culture, we also think about it often as something that is that is fairly soft in its measurements, but indeed I hope to complicate uh, that notion for those who may hold it today. And I'm, I'm sure that many on this call do not think that way. In culture and innovation, we see that uh, both have around the same failure rate uh, in terms of culture change management and innovation initiatives around 70%. That's because they are the same thing. You can't have innovation without culture change and culture change cannot happen without innovation. And so what I'm hoping to do for the rest, few, rest of the few minutes we have today is to be able to surface some pain points and some potential solutions of how we think about the future. So in a, the US context, the, one of the biggest growing pain points is how we're thinking about work. The typical American worker is gonna spend more waking hours at work than any other part of their lives. And that's why we have about 65% of our workers are actively disengaged, which equates in, to about a $450 billion loss in revenue, not to mention the declining workforce well-being that was happening well before COVID came along. And in the U.S. context, great resignation is fully underway. So why are people leaving organizations? Well, most organizations are not working for people anymore. And despite all of the rhetoric around stakeholder capitalism that has come out since the the BlackRock letters and the CEO council letters and even Davos a couple of years ago, we're still yet to fully lean into the promise of what this means. And I think it's because a lot of organizations don't really know what to do uh, with culture. They think they can PR their way out of this. And we see this a lot, especially with the social justice work in the U.S. context. And the younger generation, uh, especially Gen Z, are, are much more savvy than the generations before them. So they can see that pretty easily. And so they're looking for organizations that work for them. And uh, Linda Gratton at the London Business School, you know, she notes that over the last hundred years or so, about every decade, we add about two years to life. And so in the U.S. context, a, a child born in 2007, on average, is expected to live around 100 years old. And so this model that comes out of a 100-year industrial economy where you get your education, then you go to work, and then you retire for those who are lucky enough to be able to retire in today's world, that is just not a model that a younger generation is thinking about. Because if you're going to be living longer, you're going to be working longer. So what does that work life look like? Most organizations are really not set up to handle this. And certainly we see some educational uh, institutions like the one we're working in here at the University of Colorado beginning to, to prepare uh, and actively operationalize some of these ideas, but it's early days to be sure. So when we think about the future, what I want to pose to you is that an artist, creatives, they are cultural futurists. And in that cultural futurist role, there's really three roles. There's the role of the analyst, the role of the entrepreneur, and the role of the catalyst. When we think about analysts, we think about things like my uh, colleague, Carol Graham, who works at the Brookings Institute, who know, whose work on the deaths of despair in the U.S. context have been uh, profoundly impactful and are beginning to shape everything from how the White House is thinking about deploying its uh, 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 Build Back Better uh, dollars that were just recently passed. And then the work that I'm, I'm involved in with REM and our colleagues Harris, um, Iyer, and, and others through the Brain Capital Index that is a 
uh, coming out of the OECD, I think also signals that when we think about things like GDP, certainly that tells us what is happening, but it doesn't tell us why. Why is a question that must be transdisciplinary and come out of a human context. My own work has worked uh, for the last several years, has developed a, 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 pro a project within the National Science Foundation that we have been able to empirically measure uh, the cultural viability of an organization or an ecosystem as a context of hope, trust, and belonging. And through those metrics and also the submetrics of creativity, curiosity, and compassion, we have been able to validate that we can predict many of the key performance indicators that are critical in future of work. We are getting ready also here at the University of Colorado to use this model in cooperation with Penn State's Cognitive Neuroscience Creativity Lab to stand up what will be the largest study ever to measure the relationship between culture, well-being, and creativity and how people's identities mediates that relationship. We're going to be standing that work up in the first quarter of next year, and it's very, very exciting to think what it might hold for us. And we'll be pulling that through with a global Future of Creativity Summit, uh, looking at creativity and the future of work, the future of education, the future of healthcare in Denver in July of next year. And when we think about the role of culture of futurist entrepreneur is certainly there. Uh, my uh, colleague, Teresa Amable at Harvard, she notes that uh, the environmental conditions for creativity matter. So you may have a gr individual group whose lived experience, like in the U.S. context, um, say a group of um, African-Americans in the American South, their lived experience dictates and helps them to understand where there may be novel opportunities for value creation, but whether or not that ever becomes enterprise-wide innovation that has a market valuation really depends upon the alignment of the organization with the group that surfaced the novel insight. Most organizations are not really leaning into this. And, and though I, I don't know Dr. Amable directly, she and uh, Maggie Bowden out of the U UK have been real North stars in my work and have really helped to shape a lot of this work. And I also think it's interesting that a lot of the people, uh, scholars that I'm looking at, happen to be uh, women scholars. I think that uh, the, the lived experience of women, uh, especially in the Western context, because that's the one I know and I can speak to, uh, have dictated different questions to be asked of data sets. When we think about compassion, we see in the healthcare context that a 90-second compassion intervention, compassion being very different from empathy, compassion is an action indicator, but compassion, a 90 second intervention can actually improve patient outcomes. And when we think about compassion as an indicator of trust in, in communications environments, we have some really big opportunities ahead of us. And finally, when we think about things like curiosity, my team does a lot of curiosity phenotyping. There's about 55 possible curiosity phenotypes. And most organizations that we see out of 55 possible curiosity phenotypes, about 90% of most organizations, uh, curiosity phenotypes reside in about four to five out of 55 possible. So what that means is that organizations are doing a really good job of hiring for culture fit. But if one thing changes in their external environment that changes the operating conditions, they don't really have the capacity to think differently. And so finally, I'll end here is that when we think about a cultural futurist, we have to be, have to talk about uh, artists as catalyst. And so I put to you that entrepreneurial leadership and the future of creativity means that organizations live the best story their people can tell. We hire brilliant people in our organizations, but or most organizations are not really fully re leading into the opportunity that presents. There's many reasons for that, uh, but as we think about that, uh, again, I'll pull from Maggie Bowden, uh, there are three areas of leadership for you to be thinking about. One is exploratory leadership. That's where most uh, of our uh, leadership and entrepreneurism happens today. And that's a defined space with gatekeepers in place. Then there's combinatorial leadership. Combinatorial leadership is where you take an idea from one place and an idea from two, another place and you put them together. 
while that should be something that machine learning, for example, can do very well, machine learning can't really do the second part of the science of creativity, uh, which is the value creation part. And then, so I will leave you with this. What are the opportunities for transformational leadership? I think the opportunities for transformational leadership are leaning into uh, the lived experience that people have in the world that shape their identities and how they make meaning, and then beginning to build new business models around that and funding those business models in a way that may look different than we've ever seen in the past, but the upside is immense. And I'm very happy to be with you here today. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Theo, for this very, very interesting uh, presentation and for bringing all these uh, new ideas of uh, cultural well-being, inclusion, uh, the curiosity, compassion, also for explaining, uh, because we, we, we've been reading a lot about the great uh, quit or re resignation and also to give an insight of uh, what is, is going on and how culture is uh, linked completely to identity and experience of life. So thank you very, very much for, for all this presentation. You're very um, welcome. I like uh, to move forward now and to uh, present our next uh, guest, um, Montserrat uh, Pareja Estoway, who is Director of Cultural Management uh, Master. She is economist, PhD in economics, Vice Chair of the European Network for Housing Research, uh, Barcelona Chapter Coordinator of the, of the Research Group on Collaborative Spaces, expert on innovation and urban creativity. She has uh, collaborated in many European projects uh, also that I have here um, somewhere, Crea Orbs, Innova, Crea Space, Be Spect Active. So um, she also devotes her research to the analysis of urban problems and in particular its impact on social, cultural and economical aspects. So um, I like also to, to ask her, so from the point of view of Europe, let's say, so what is the ground? And in this changing scenario also that is affecting not only the United States, but also Europe, what is the ground needed to enhance culture and entrepreneurship, especially among women? So I give the screen now to Montserrat Paneja. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina. And first of all, while I'm sharing my screen that I hope that you are able to see right now. Um, yes, it's it's okay for everybody. Yeah, there we go. Right. Is. So as I was saying, thank you, Christina, and thank you uh, to the organizers, to the CreateMec project to, for having me here. And as, as you very well said, Christina, I am and an urban economist, and uh, I've been paying attention to creative and cultural industries for a while right now. And uh, I thought that since our round table was uh, meant to be discussing uh, the relevance of uh, enable, enables and, and barriers in ecosystems, I, I just thought to myself, uh, okay, we will touch the entrepreneurship uh, in a side way, uh, but let's let's go and, and see which were my, my reflections when when thinking about the title of, of the table. So the first thing that I thought was um, meant to be discussed is up to what extent we do have ecosystems that are uh, different in CCIs to non-CCIs. And, and probably when we talk about an ecosystem, we, we know that it's always place-based. Uh, it's always allocate, located in, in, a, in a particular context, but we know very well that uh, context matters all the time, but in a different way when we talk about creative and cultural industries and uh, when we look at other more, uh, let's say, traditional industries where uh, creativity or knowledge are not the main uh, inputs for, for production. So somehow what I, I would like to, to share with you today is uh, what is different in, in these ecosystems, uh, in these creative and cultural sector ecosystems, and, and why do we have to look at them in a, in a different way? 
which of course that will be my final conclusion that we definitely need to look at them uh, differently from uh, a, a cluster or an ecosystem of uh, the automobile sector. So I think that uh, maybe the, the first important thing that has already been mentioned in our uh, session today is that uh, when we look at culture and creativity, besides being able to create growth and create jobs, they are contributing to other very important things like well-being, health, social inclusion, and I, I, I would continue the list. And, and I think that uh, this is important uh, because uh, when we are supporting culture and creativity, uh, we are supporting all these things. Of course, we, we might be looking at the need of local development or job creation, as I said before, but uh, fortunately, I would say, uh, culture and creativity are somehow producing uh, a lot of spillovers in other fields, in other areas of, of, of our, our society. And this is one of the reasons why uh, ecosystems, creative and cultural ecosystems, uh, deserve uh, a good attention uh, in order to understand how they work, because without understanding uh, this extra value, if I may, uh, we will be missing a, a very important point. Creative and cultural sectors are mainly uh, driven by uh, the drivers of people. And when we talk about cities, we always and saying, well, cities are people, the people that live, like Jane Jacobs uh, used to say in the past, no? the importance of people. Uh, I think that the vocational aspect or the, uh, let's say, the motivation of those that are involved in cultural and creative uh, industries or sectors are very important. We know, because we have done research on, on that, that the boundaries in between the personal and the professional life are quite blurred in this in these creative and cultural sectors that um, you you don't need to you know um, to, to devote time for your family or time for your uh, colleagues because somehow they all belong to the same status and and this is again important to understand how to support these uh, ecosystems because um, this is not the case when we talk about the CEO of, uh, I don't know, Volkswagen or, or the CEO of any other traditional. I mean, of course, there are people which have a very important vocation and, and, and driver in their sector. But I, I would say that uh, relatively, uh, this is very important in the case of cultural and creative sectors. As important as the dimension of these cultural and creative industries that, that has been mentioned, and, and we know about that, we know that uh, SMEs are more probably than 85% of the industrial fabric uh, in these sectors. So they do have a different feeling about what uh, what do they need. I mean, they, they we know, and, and probably this is also the case in, in in, in many sectors that the heterogeneity in terms of dimension, in terms of um, how, in, in fields, let's say, uh, it, it's, it's huge. Um, so for instance, in the publishing sector, we can find monsters, really big companies, but at the same time, uh, we also look at very small and medium companies that are, as I said before, driven by the, their CEO or the, or the person, the entrepreneur that was uh, aiming to create something different out of the, his passion. Uh, emotions and passions is something that I would like to pay a little bit more attention uh, later on. But uh, what I mean is that if we have in mind the need to support ecosystems, uh, we need to understand this heterogeneity. And in particular, I think that uh, it, it is important to, to keep in mind that Lots of uh, cultural and creative sectors are companies that do not have uh, empl em employees, uh, which means that uh, or workers. No, they are they are uh, composed but by only one uh, person. Uh, the cultural and creative sectors also um, have a very particular way of uh, learning, and and we know that. Uh, cultural and creative sectors is not only about formal education, it is about skills, 
it is about feelings, it is about uh, experience and expertise. And, and we have done, again, some research about um, how these skills and this knowledge is perceived and, and, and uh, accumulated in, in, every, in every worker. And, and we know that in this case, I mean, maybe in other industries that could happen as well, but in this case, uh, there are different drivers and different ways to approach uh, education. I, I remember that uh, when we were talking about video games in Spain, uh, 10 years ago, there was nothing about like a, a university where you could learn uh, the video games, producing video games or, or developing video games. And it was the companies, the ones that were responsible to, um, to, to, to create some, some skills. Well, these formal and informal learning spaces also uh, moves me to talk about the importance of communities. And, and I think that uh, communities are somehow the soul of cultural and creative industries. And, and these communities that are uh, somehow uh, blurred in the sense that they don't have membership, uh, they do share some kind of code of identity, some code of behavior, and that they build knowledge by themselves and they accumulate knowledge by the, themselves. Uh, they are so so important uh, in creative and cultural sector. So sometimes transactions, uh, which could be related to education, but could also be related to uh, exchanging uh, expertise, uh, do not go through the market. And I think that this is uh, important. As I was mentioning, the, the relevance of uh, communities, I think that one very important thing when we think about ecosystems and enables and, and barriers to creative and cultural sectors ecosystems is the capacity and the relevance of networking among the peers among the people that are participating in these communities because somehow and that was mentioned by my pre my predecessor in the session uh, trust and reputation uh, do play a key role in, in these sectors. I mean, sometimes it is not the CV that it's important. It is what you have heard of this person and what is the reputation. Let's not forget about uh, reputation these days that uh, you, can, you can reach uh, how a person is acknowledged in the community very easily, social media, internet, uh, whatever. So important, network important. I would like to make a point in terms of technology. I was in a roundtable uh, last week uh, talking about cultural projects and technology, and it was clear that technology is absolutely a, a driver for new business models. It's a driver for creating new content. It's a driver or a tool for uh, producing uh, new access to uh, finance, for instance. But I would like to stress the fact that uh, technology do not produce per se, cultural projects. So somehow, I think that uh, technology is, we, we should see uh, in this context of the ecosystem, uh, technology as an essential tool. I mean, I'm not taking uh, at all, I'm not, I'm not dismissing, diminishing the importance of technology. It is very important, but I think that uh, we need to combine uh, technology with this perception of the idea of what it is a cultural or creative project. I think that it is also important in terms of uh, thinking about our uh, ecosystems, uh, the capacity of getting into their career, these SMEs, companies, or these entrepreneur, uh, somehow these global production networks that are today extended not only in traditional sectors like the automobile, but also in creative and cultural industries, this global connection, this global local tension, uh, I think that it's uh, very important because today, and you have in the image uh, a theater company that uh, was awarded with an international um, award, and, and they, they became immediately acknowledged as a good uh, company, good theater company that were uh, producing very interesting stuff. So uh, somehow, uh, these awards uh, and, and fairs as well act as a sort of gatekeepers of uh, these small and medium uh, companies. Um, we were talking before about, um, Theo was mentioning this, uh, he was insisting on, on innovation and the capacity to, to be innovative. And, and 
what I would like to, to say is uh, somehow uh, thinking about my colleagues in, in Montreal, uh, that they were put, paying attention to the, the, these connectors in between the fertile soil of creativity and those firms, institutions, these formal organizations. Uh, one of them, well, some of them very much producing um, creativity in itself. The others very much in need of this creativity in order to produce um, innovation. And I think that within this idea of the ecosystem, uh, we need to identify which are the spots in the ecosystem that are acting as connectors in between creativity and innovation. Um, we shouldn't, and that was also mentioned uh, during uh, this uh, the previous session, the importance of regulation, and, and there, is, there, there are lots of fields within uh, uh, creative and cultural sectors that are uh, playing a role in the competitiveness of these sectors. I mean, I, I, I like to use the example of South Korea uh, that opted for, uh, let's be open, let's share everything. I mean, the, the, the dichotomy into, into property rights and creative commons. So let's, let's open and let's uh, become popular all over the world. And that will create a different business model like the one based on, on property rights. I think that we are advanced. I think that uh, Europe needs somehow to um, to take into account this global scenario in order to produce adequate uh, regulation. Not only Europe, but uh, we were, uh, CREAC Met is about uh, the Mediterranean. And I think that uh, it is interesting to understand differences and also similarities in between uh, frameworks that are shaping somehow uh, these creative and cultural sectors. Just, uh, I think that I have a couple of slides more. Uh, I think that within the ecosystem, the access to finance is something that is always important. And for many years, we have heard that um, policy instruments, policy tools were not enough adequate to the needs of the cultural sector. Uh, we know that uh, technology in this case and the, these crowdfunding models that are emerging are playing a role especially to finance uh, short-term uh, loans or short-term access to finance for uh, entrepreneurs and, and new ideas and so on and so forth. Uh, we know that there are, and, and, and this is very exciting, no? this ethical bank is looking at culture as one of the fields of development. I think that we need to redefine the access to finance or to understand within the context of uh, the ecosystem uh, which could be uh, the right access uh, to finance. It has also been mentioned the importance of creative hubs, and I would, would like just to stress that the synergies that are created in between different creative and cultural industries are the basis for innovation, the, uh, the, the creative clash, I would say, and creative hubs are somehow not only faci facilitating the relationship in between similar uh, cultural and creative sectors, but different. And, and I think that this is uh, something that is somehow promoting uh, a, a, a very good level of uh, innovation. My last slide, and I, I hope that I, I was on time. Um, I think my conclusions are very, very uh, easy to understand. I think that, uh, in my opinion, the first thing to uh, to take into consideration when looking at ecosystems and when looking at, at uh, young and women's entrepreneurship is that we need to understand which are the real needs of these uh, creative and cultural sectors because they are not comparable. I mean, even within the cultural and creative sectors, we do feel that there are different needs. And uh, again, uh, maybe uh, this is a little bit too abstract, but I, I, I think that if we look, if we think about barriers, um, maybe the lack of empathy and, and the fact that we are not able to be resilient enough to understand that there are other ways of thinking, that serendipity can create a uh, lot of, you know, uh, innovative ideas and that this doesn't go exactly through the way that uh, uh, close innovation uh, used to dominate the market in the past. 
I think that we need an, an op, an, a broad open mind in order to understand uh, um, how we can, within the ecosystem, how we can sympathize with those that are part of this ecosystem. And, and then somehow, uh, while we understand them and when we sympathize with them, how to create the connection. Because again, at the end of the day, it's a question of trust and confidence. Thank you very much, Christina. The, floor, the, the, the screen is yours. Thank you very much also for this very, very interesting presentation, uh, Montserrat, and for bringing this idea also, I think that um, in your conclusion that what are really the needs of the CCI, because we are talking about CCIs as, as a whole, but you also brought the idea, uh, this is not, uh, that we think of it sometimes as a homogeneous, but this is a very heterogeneous market and is, and you know, we are just talking as, as if it was the same uh, in terms of SMAs and also of the products or of the products, I mean, of the art we are producing or innovation. Mm -hmm. So uh, thanks for bringing also this, um, this idea. I think uh, we have time for a question that I wanted to, um, to uh, uh, and that would be because we were we are talking about the United States, we are talking about Europe, but uh, this project, as you know, are from the southern uh, Mediterranean countries. So I like to know, I like to hear from you. What would be the lessons that you could share to um, to the to the these um, let's say ecosystem in the southern Mediterranean countries? I mean, most of them you already were talking, but most specific in the southern Mediterranean countries. If you want to start. Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I, I can start uh, briefly. Uh, I think that uh, cultural and creative sectors, uh, for instance, around Europe have learned from, from the different parts of Europe, of Europe because as I said, um, it is not exactly the same what happens in the south of Europe and in the north of Europe in terms of uh, creative and cultural sectors. We do have the UK that uh, was for a long while, while <clears throat> the one that moved uh, a step forward and the others were like followers. The fact of be not being the leader in terms of ecosystem or sector, uh, I think that we all need to be our own leader, but uh, you know what I mean? Uh, it's... Um, uh, favors the fact that we can learn from the mistakes that the other uh, have done. And it, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just thinking that uh, we were always praising the UK because they were good on data, they were good on ideas, they were good on formalizing, uh, uh, you know, everything that was related to creative and cultural industries, they bet for that uh, early on. I think that maybe what we can learn from them South Europe, Southern Europe, or let's say other parts of Europe that are not the UK, and that could be, you know, uh, translated into the Southern Mediterranean, is that they uh, this motion that was very important during the 90s is not as important anymore. No, and then we have this political commitment that I think it's important, and somehow I feel that since we are all saying that the future is in cultural and creative sectors, uh, we all share that the recovery agenda will have the cultural and creative sectors as one of the key pieces. Uh, I think that the, the most important element to learn from those that uh, have been leaders in, the, in, in this uh, trajectory is that uh, the momentum uh, has to last longer somehow and and this is uh something that we know uh this the, the idea, i think that uh entrepreneurship in young people and uh, or from young people and, and women in in the in the south of the mediterranean is key to somehow catalyze uh all the other uh entrepreneurships other uh, elements that can create and can develop even uh, further this already existing ecosystem. So keep on going. That would be my message. Just, um, I, I put it another way. So 
what what are the opportunities for interconnection for the entrepreneurs in the CCI from the Mediterranean region and what digitalization can offer? Because also this was one question that you both mentioned about uh, digitalization and technology and what is, if sometimes if we think it's more an enabler or, of, or, or a barrier. So what, what can offer to the Mediterranean this uh, digitalization? I don't know if... Uh, Theo, you like to take the floor? Sure, a couple of thoughts come to mind. <clears throat> I come from a uh, public and population health background. So we, we have a environmental approach to this. So we don't look, for example, I think where a lot of businesses make in, 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 um, in VCs make mistakes is they look at the motivation of say an individual as the thing that needs to be fixed. So what I, in public health, we look at it as the environmental conditions that need to be addressed. And so from, from that respect, we've seen quite a bit of uh, science get successfully translated around the globe using things like there's a model that, that I use quite a lot it's called the Pen3 culture model. And what it looks at is a, is a way of understanding how to translate science into different cultures through the lens of cultural identity, cultural relationships and expectations and cultural empowerment. And so when you think about the opportunities that are out there in research to deploy some of those models and contextualizing and expanding portfolios of opportunity, I don't think we have to recreate the will. I think we just have to maybe, uh, you know, engage in some of the translation between disciplines uh, in, in, in the approach. Uh, the other thing that that surfaces for me that I, I think quite a lot about these days is with relationship to Gen Z. Um, because Gen Z being digital natives, I think that it often gets uh, the conversation centers around these, these short kind of hedonic feedback loops that they're engaging in from the dopamine hit they're wanting from the engagement of you know, their technology platforms. But what I find really fascinating also is that Gen Z is the first generation and many generations who have uh, really demonstrated a sustained longevity commitment to environmental and social justice. And so when we think about those feedback loops, those are really long feedback loops. And we've never been at a point in human history and require skill acquisition, envisioning future states that are uncertain and not here today. So when you think about the opportunity for those kind of uh, technology short feedback loops that in which they're engaged and they're simultaneously holding these very long future oriented goals that require new skills to be developed, how we bridge and merge those two things together through a lens of identity, uh, I find to be completely thrilling because I think that uh, uh, sometimes uh, us older folks need to get out of the way and support the younger generation and how they're thinking about things, not to influence them, but to bring our experience to helping them uh, in the directions that they're setting. So uh, those are the two things, these, these kind of ways that we have proven that we can translate science into different cultures around the world and the models that do that. And then how Gen Z is thinking about pulling these two aspects of themselves together. I think both point to incredible opportunities, uh, no matter what region of the world that we're talking about. Maybe also we were talking about uh, these homogeneous and uh, also we can apply to different regions of the, of the world, these, all these ideas, of course. So, uh, well, thank you very much. I don't think we have mm, more time and we, I, okay. I'll just thank you very much for this very interesting and fruitful uh, discussion. Really it's been fascinating to hear all these, all these uh, really innovative ideas for me to hear about, uh, you know, the brain capital index and, and, you know, that we can have metrics as hope, trust and belonging really, you know, I think it brings also hope just to, to this uh, industry. And thank you very much to both of you. I give uh, now the screen to Yehane Forosh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, it was hard to <laughs> pronounce. Yeah. And she will explain the new initiative in Lebanon. And thank you, Theo. Thank you, Monse, for being with us uh, this afternoon, this morning.
Thank you very much, Christina. Uh, let me just uh, take a few moments of your time to present this <clears throat> initiative. Okay. Yes. So um, this is a, a new initiative, a Bike Rack for Med, uh, that we plan to launch to support culture and creative industries, specifically in Lebanon. Why? Because of the current situation uh, that the country is uh, going, I explained a little bit this morning, but as we all know, the economic situation is quite dire. Uh, the country is going over the worst economic crisis in the country since its establishment. Uh, it's one of the top three, the most important crises since the uh, beginning of the 19th century. Uh, so this is um, was um, an argument given by the World Bank. Uh, but what we observe is a massive brain drain in all sectors. CCI uh, is suffering in particular from the lack of opportunities, small market size, local currency devaluation, uh, which, uh, you know, the Lebanese lira lost its value over then uh, 80, 86, 85% uh, of its value. So it's huge. I mean, the, um, the, the, we, as we know, the current situation is pretty bad. There we have seen uh, a degradation in the infrastructure, uh, frequent electricity cuts, poor internet connection, uh, even uh, penury in gas and et cetera, the list uh, goes on. Uh, so, uh, we have thought uh, within the crack format, we can launch an initiative with the main goals to support uh, local small businesses in the CCI to survive during the crisis and also to assist them to explore their products and services. So, um, and the main actions within these initiatives that we uh, thought about is to provide a platform, a digital platform for entrepreneurs and the small businesses to promote their products and services and also like launching a virtual, virtual conference to promote uh, this initiative and the platform uh, in the Christmas time, uh, like Christmas calls. And uh, to partner with shipment companies to assist their pro uh, products to export because one of the main barriers for uh, CCI entrepreneurs is how to export uh, within the shipment and also within the payment. So we want to provide payment solutions for small businesses uh, whether in US dollars or a, another foreign currency or in uh, NFT or non-fungible tokens. Um, so these are uh, the main ideas of this action that will uh, evolve around. And I want to end my presentation with this, um, the, this picture of a statue uh, which was uh, created by the Lebanese artist Hayat Nazar. Uh, after the uh, Beirut blast uh, or uh, the explosion the, uh, happened in Beirut in uh, August 24th of August 2020, that was devastating, especially for the cultural scene also. Um, and I want to, uh, I mean, this is statue for me talks a lot by itself. It's a woman rising hand with a scarred face, yet standing strong, uh, living her hair, uh, like open to the wind and I think it sends a very strong message uh, in terms of hope and resistance and I think it's an example that showcases why art is so important why arts uh, is so powerful it brings people together and we need to uh, support those artists and um, and I, I think uh, it's it was mentioned during this morning uh, in Pierre Luigi's uh, presentation by Montserrat as well, that uh, arts and culture is beyond just economic, uh, you know, uh, added value or job creations. Uh, the, the social uh, added value and the um, the contribution to health and well-being of the societies is also crucial. So this is why uh, this initiative is so important for us to be launched. So stay tuned. Uh, we will continue uh, to keep you updated on the ev evolution of this uh, initiative and once we launch it. And thank you very much for your time and uh, listening to me. Yeah. So I think uh, we leave the floor to Reem for the closing.
Thank you very much, uh, Yagane. Uh, you, you made me think of a phoenix uh, emerging from the ashes for Lebanon. I mean, uh, that was the main idea I got from that uh, last slide you mentioned. But I also would like to add one thing, that this initiative came from the Lebanese team, uh, which, in fact, have been very much engaged with us within this period of the mapping. Uh, and this is a, uh, a voluntary initiative, which we will do it uh, within the CREACT for uh, MED initiative um, to really try to think outside the box on how we, uh, this project could, uh, could uh, support uh, the solo artists in uh, the difficulties uh, they are encountering in uh, in Lebanon. So um, uh, obviously, this is uh, this is a an, an important action, uh, and I hope uh, we will be able to uh, achieve it. So, uh, as a conclusion of this day, uh, I would like first of all to thank all the moderators, the speakers, the panelists for the great uh, inspiring contributions uh, of this first day of the CREACT uh, for uh, MED annual conferences, which I repeat, this is the first annual conference of these uh, projects. Uh, what we have learned today is a lot. I cannot uh, spend two minutes uh, to summarize because I will not uh, give uh, all what we have uh, learned in a couple of minutes, but what I, uh, what I can say is uh, culture and creativity are transformational uh, for the economies, because this is important, but beyond this for the societies and the behaviors as a whole. This is what we uh, understood this morning. And in my view, it must also be recognized as the backbone of the post-COVID-19 recovery plan. So uh, this economy or this culture creative economy must be supported uh, to ensure that uh, the recovery will uh, happen and will happen with this pillar as, uh, as not only a pillar for uh, uh, value creation for the common economy, for the communities and for the society, for the Mediterranean and Africa specifically, since we are active in this uh, region. What we also learned uh, today is that beyond financial and economic value creation, which are two very important uh, concepts for economists, uh, and also obviously job creation, of course the whole debate of job creation uh, will be reviewed and revised uh, because of the future of work, and we heard it also from Theo. Uh, we also must think about community value creation. We heard uh, compassion, we heard uh, about interconnection, we heard about support, solidarity also, it's very important. Uh, but also we heard about well-being, flourishing and overall happiness uh, that we need to achieve. Uh, and I think culture and creativity are two fundamental pillars for these construction. Uh, we also heard uh, health and brain health and longevity. I think we need to uh, open a bit the disciplines, of course, not within this project, but we need to think about it. Uh, let's not forget that our spine is research. So we are trying to bridge uh, science, uh, policy and action. So this is for a MEA team uh, to think together with all the partners and the experts working with us to try to think of innovative mechanisms and concepts that are encompassing and try really to think outside the box uh, of what we heard uh, today. today. So what, what we have today is a lot of food for thought uh, that will certainly drive us to continue the uh, process of co-creation and to develop this concept of cultural creativity uh, that again would like it to uh, become a pillar for human, economic and societal resilience. So the concept of resilience is uh, becoming a key concept for the 
post COVID 19 uh, recovery. And I think uh, culture and creativity could be a pillar for that resilience. Uh, so again, thank you very much for these inspiring contributions. Um, tomorrow we will convene again at 2 p.m. Uh, our time, so it's uh, Barcelona time, uh, to continue with the three sessions. Uh, one on the regional CCI initiatives. So there are several initiatives that are also trying to achieve very similar uh, results. I think the, uh, this is important as well to create synergies between uh, the initiatives. Also a session on the CCI enablers and specific actions. And then uh, we will conclude the day with the announcement of the results of the call of incubation subgrants. Uh, and then we will give further tips on uh, the uh, creation of the CCI Mediterranean uh, Hub. With this, I thank you again, and I thank all the team, MEA team, and all the CREAC for MEA team for this great uh, and very inspiring uh, day. And I wish you a great evening, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>